be like, who is this jerk face that I followed? What do you mean you're interview? Who the <laughs> heck is Kyle Mercury? <laughs> <laughs> um, I actually need to double check. What was my go live message? I have no idea at this point. It was. Pro I'm pretty sure I remembered to name drop you in it, and they'll be like, who is this though? I think the only one who's gonna know is Darren. You know. <laughs> I have a mod view. Holy crap. There is a lot going on. Yeah. If you are curious about how all of that works, I have been learning how mod view in Twitch works, so I can go over that with you if you intend to stream on Twitch. I don't. I'm not sure <laughs> that I have the, the wherewithal these days. I thought about it for a while with Monster Hunter World, just because I was mm -hmm. sort of on the bleeding edge of that game. Right. Uh, Wait, when you say bleeding edge of that game, what do you mean? <clears throat> I mean that, you know, there's people who play games casually and there's people who get sort of invested and then there's right. people like me who mine games for every last possible nugget and detail and then tailor their performance accordingly oh my goodness uh, so you're one of those super hardcore gamers who just dig up everything well that's the thing i wouldn't necessarily say i'm a hardcore gamer but when i find the game a game that i like okay now i'm hosting yours uh <laughs> When I find a game that I like, or I find a game that interests me, you know, Monster Hunter came about because I had friends that play it who introduced me to it, mm -hmm. and uh, I was looking for a Destiny replacement because Destiny 2 just did not do what it needed to do. <laughs> hey Reggie, welcome to the stream. I've got Kyle live with me. We're going to get the game going in just a second. I need to update my little, uh, what's it called, my display name, since apparently that's what all the cool kids do now. Uh, and Monster Hunter just sort of became <coughs> that game. I mean, I still play Destiny 1, but Monster Hunter became that game. And so it's every every mm -hmm. patch, you're you're digging apart what's changed, what's not. Every new, every tiny little new feature that's been added, every new piece of content, you're right on top of your, you know, in that, yeah. in that top 5% <coughs> of players. Excuse me. Wow. I just I'm certainly not like a speedrunner or a professional or anything of that measure, but I if I choose to play a game, I want to be the best at it. Yeah, so when I play video games, I just try to beat the story. <laughs> oh crap, what? Oh shit, why am I losing damage? Oh fuck, you know what? I think I left this off on like a uh debuff where if I don't kill stuff, I take damage. So go ahead and keep talking. <laughs> don't worry about me. Oh, those wizard guys are the worst because they're energy balls oh, through solid objects. You've played this game? Oh, yeah. I, you know, this was like a random find. I think I picked it up when it's still in early access. Why am I talking about myself? We should be talking about you. <laughs> no, but I did. Well, yes. So, not to, to go straight into it, but like a good example. <clears throat> so, I, when I was at Nintendo, mm -hmm. uh, one of the things I always sort of would get razzed about is that I had never pl really played a Legend of Zelda or Metroid game. <laughs> oh my gosh. Uh, I guess you could so, consider this like a Metroidvania, huh? Right, a little bit, yeah, like a Metroidvania. So, but uh, in, oh man, I don't remember what year it was, late 90s. Oh, one second. I paused the game so oh. I could adjust OBS so that I can see the chat, because I know it's going to blow <laughs> up with all those integrations. So, Reggie, since you are in the chat, you now get to type one of those three words in there and choose for me what I get. Thank you for the brutality vote. What? Yeah, that's right. That's right. That's right. That is the cool part about stream integration with this game. Now, if chat would be oh. so kind as to type so that we can open this darn thing... Come on, guys. Come on. It's okay. You can spam in the chat. Spam in the chat. It's good. It's good. You're good. Isn't this game fantastic? This is one of the few games that integrates it like this. That's why I was like, yo, if nobody shows up, I can't progress in the game. But as you were saying, Nintendo, Metroidvania, go on. So when we, Nintendo ran an event mm -hmm. that I helped produce called Cube Club, okay. which was basically a giant mobile Nintendo arcade. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we were in New York City, and mm -hmm. we wanted to do something special. Yeah. New York City was our last market. We wanted to do something special. So we decided, my brother and I, who was working with me and a few of our friends, decided we wanted to recreate or do our best to recreate the tournament from The Wizard. 
Wait, so when you say so, it was your last city, New York, this is when you were working at Nintendo, right? Yes. Yes. What do you mean by last city? So it was a tour of sorts. Where oh, I get you. We would go to a city, we would set up the Cube Club uh -huh, for and promote. two weeks. And promote and hang out and have all kinds of like sponsor nights and game oh, nights. Oh, wow. It was basically a way to show off. <laughs> a bunch of the newest games. And right, right, right. Newest games. I mean, we had the Metroid Prime demo. That's the time. Frame. Metroid Prime demo. Wait, when did that yes. one come out? Oh man. So again, this is like early. This must be like ninety nine, two thousand ish. Maybe even earlier. Oh gosh. Uh, <laughs> the chicken is still locked to someone who's no longer in the chat. <laughs> I can't heal. I can't heal this run because the chicken is locked. So I may die, and then we'll have to restart the run. Can't heal. Did, it's did Booty Farts Twenty Two. Like, follow you, the legended Zelda chicken. <laughs> uh, <laughs> See how that just popped up in chat? He's not here. He has no idea that I'm streaming. Oh. I'm gonna die. I have one. Oh shoot. Come on, you still got ten percent of your health. I got. I, I got a little bit of heal. I, I got this. I got to speed run this. That's all. But keep going. Don't don't mind um, me. I just got, got a speed the, uh, run, so I don't got die. Got the vampire perk on. You just gotta keep jumping. <clears throat> so yes, we decided to recreate this tournament. We did a two-day tournament of every game that was in Cube Club, and this is like mm -hmm. uh, 007, Nightfire, Godzilla, King of the Monsters, Metroid, Mario Party, like five or six, which everyone had Bookworm in it. Uh, Basically, you have to play every game in <coughs> the Cube Club. But to finish it, mm -hmm. we, we weren't sure how we could really sort of like blow this tournament out of the water. Like, what can we do for the final game that's really going to like endear everybody who's playing mm -hmm. to make it really Oh, uh, watch me die. I knew it. I knew it'd be a fall. I have no idea where to go. All right. Down that hole. <laughs> Down we go. Oh, the ramparts are the <laughs> worst to navigate. But I am trying. Uh, I'm, I'm keeping track of the conversation. No, I'm not. I'm focusing on the game now. How are we going to do this? How are we going to do this? Because like, it'd be cool to play a game in the background. I'm, it's not in the background at all. Um, so you just have Q Club. You guys... Um, yep. I caught Q Club and you were promoting. So, well, yeah. And so if you've seen The Wizard, they, mm -hmm. that, that movie was the premiere of Super Mario Bros. 3. And we wanted to do something on that scale. Right. Uh, but I was limited to mm -hmm. the games that I could have in Q Club. I couldn't bring in anything additional, only the games that we were promoting at the time. So I see. Fun little fact, mm -hmm. uh, that Metroid Prime demo, yes. there was, inter if you used the GB Game Boy Advance Connect cable, you could oh connect my gosh. Game Boy Advance and a GameCube to unlock special content in certain games. Oh my One gosh. of the games that's unlockable in Metroid Prime is original Metroid, but only if you connect a completed Metroid Fusion run, the uh, Game Boy Advance game. That, that's such a like so, niche thing to reward people for. Like, How many fans would have been able to do that? Uh, well, I went home on Saturday night and beat Metroid Fusion in <laughs> one sitting. Oh my gosh. So I could come in on Sunday mm -hmm. and prep original metroid to be the final game for the cube club tournament oh my goodness how long did that take you to do it all in one setting uh, or sitting probably, we closed the club on saturday night probably like 10 or 11 p.m and then i played metroid fusion until i probably played it for like three or four hours maybe a little bit more and just sort of like black all i needed was the the save game, the complete save game to I unlock see. it in the prime book. Yeah, so I just, I blasted through, <laughs> uh, came and in the next morning mm -hmm. and got two consoles all set up. And it's funny, there were some real like hardcore Nintendo people who would show up uh, at Cube Club. And a couple of them knew, a couple of them knew that, uh, they're like, I bet you're going to have original Metroid be the final game. Uh, like, yep. And then we, it was just awesome. We had the, both players play back to back so they couldn't see each other's screens. And it was the uh, the first person to collect the first five upgrades in Metroid, mm -hmm. and the whole club was just like people were screwed. Every time somebody would get an upgrade, 
they'd cheer for the person who got it, go for it, then they'd run to the other person to see how close they were to getting it. It was just this ping pong match between these two consoles. It was so much fun. So, this this Metroid final you're talking about, it's only like a four hour game? Uh, Metroid Fusion? No, it's way longer. Uh, I mean, I, I s sort of speed ran it just to get the save game, but ah. Metroid Fusion is a brilliant Metroid game. Okay. Because I was like, that sounds really short for a Nintendo property. No, no, that that game's amazing, and it certainly can take the time. Mm -hmm. If you take the time with the game, I went back and ended up playing it, playing it. Uh, okay, gotcha. Because I had so much fun speed running it, I wanted to go through an action and do a like a hundred percent run. Yeah, I remember. I I kind of did sort of a speed run of. Have you heard of Thirteen Sentinels Aegis Rim? I have not. So one of my acquaintances, I want to call him a friend, but I don't know if we're quite there yet. He probably considers me a friend. So Christian Lamont, who is a voice actor, he is uh, he was the audio director, voice director, something like that, for 13 Sentinels. It is a visual novel in the style oh, okay. of like Danganronpa, though it's, it's less to do okay. with murder and all of that and more to do with uh, uh, homage to sci-fi games. Oh, nice. Yes, yes, yes. And the reason I bring it up is because when I played through that game, I was like, yo, this game, this game's so cool. I don't want to spoil myself because I have the propensity to look up spoilers the moment I'm just like, I need to know what happens. But because yeah. I was committed to not spoiling myself on this, what I ended up doing was playing it for 20 hours straight. Oof. Hello, America. Felix. Today I have with me guest star Kyle Mercury, who worked for Nintendo and many other things. You know, just like just kind of like play him up a little, right? Um, and I also have in the background, or well, all you see here is just dead cells. The two of us are just talking over it. But um, I was just going over Thirteen Sentinels just to like do my little flex of playing for twenty hours. No, no, but go on about uh, your Q Club and all of that. The event promotion—that's what he's in. He's in events promotion. I'm an events. I'm, so I'm gonna. I'm gonna now clarify. I'm an events direction and production. I'm sorry. He, he's much higher than I. Than I. He's really high no, up no. there. <laughs> but, is, but no, that's a good distinction, right? So, and it's an important part. And I think, and unfortunately, this past year mm -hmm. has sort of hamstrung that industry a bit. Mm -hmm. Of course. But if you. When you're, if you watch like E3, or if you've been to PAX, or if you've been to E3, or if you've been to Gamescom, or if you've been to Tokyo Game Show, mm -hmm. uh, the amount of work that goes into producing and directing shows of that size is <coughs> incredible. Uh, so it's one thing, and again, I'm not saying that like event promoters <clears throat> are, are better or worse, they just do different jobs. <coughs> Uh, my my expertise really is is in directing the show while it's live. Oh wow! And sort of in real time, keeping an overview of everything that's happening on the show floor, making sure everybody sort of has what they need, putting out fires where it needs to be done. Uh, <coughs> so it's more it's much more of a real time crisis management role. <laughs> gotta put out all those fires oh shoot i almost yes. whoa that was really close i almost dove into the spikes but uh how that's... did you not just get hit by those spikes that was ridiculous that that hitbox i don't know i i don't know that's my first yeah. time it was a <laughs> fluke it's a fluke i swear I on that roll that was nuts <laughs> i promise i am not that good it's just a fluke i'd be kind of upset if i was that good and like just yeah yeah i'm not that good at gaming um <laughs> But oh goodness, what the whoa! Did you see that? There, were, uh, oh no, the mushroom! No, 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 no! Ah, 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 That's what. That was the vote. Sorry, I keep getting like super excited. So you haven't seen that before, right? Because you haven't done this integration, no. right? So that no. was the. Oh, that integration thing. Yes. So what happens is the game gets harder when you do integration because you take a modifier at the door vote. And what I meant by door vote is that's what I was afraid we were going to get stuck on. If nobody in chat had said anything, we would just sit there for the game the entire time. So hopefully you're in chat in case people are like, this is so boring. I'm leaving. Who is this like guy well, no. talking well, about I flexing? Chat, and I noticed that there's somebody named Regicide, which is my favorite. Oh, yeah. I, I greeted. Oh, I'm so sorry. I cut you off. What were you saying about Regicide? Oh, just that 
Regicide is one of my favorite tracks from the Destiny soundtrack. Oh, nice. <laughs> Reggie, is it a freaking Destiny reference? Ooh, maybe maybe it is. Maybe it is a reference. And then you can tell him all about... Nope, it's not. <laughs> Aww. <laughs> Kyle here is super into Destiny to the point where he made a podcast about like all the lore. I did. <laughs> It's like super legit, though. We I was actually gonna ask if you wanted to go over um, how you and Darren met. Yo, it's Munir. Oh, What's how, up? How Darren and I met? Yeah, we can. That's a that's a fun story. I don't know if Munir has played Hades, so you gotta like flex on him a little and give context. I hear that Darren is an incredible Hades speedrunner. He's a speedrunner? I mean, he was telling me about his build strats and stuff. You love Hades? I interviewed Darren Corb. <laughs> Don't you know who I am? No, I'm kidding, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm not Darren Corb, but I interviewed him. <laughs> Let me use this clout. <laughs> no, sorry, go on. How did you meet Darren? So, fast forwarding, like I leave Nintendo, I end up going to work for Microsoft. Uh, I mentioned this when we talked earlier, I mm -hmm. worked on, I didn't work on Kinect, but I worked on the events that helped launch Kinect. I wasn't like a technical producer on Kinect, but I was the person who was like, let's take Kinect to the world. If you remember that E3 where they had Cirque du Soleil. Oh my uh, God, they the brought Kinect in launch. Cirque du Soleil for E3. I'm not a press person. I don't know what goes on at E3. I just watch the like live streams of the games and trailers, you know? <laughs> I'm, I'm, I tell you, I'm a nobody. <laughs> I'm a nobody. That was a big year. That was Beatles Rock Band launch too. Oh. Uh, yeah, that's that's not indie enough for me to care about. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. That makes me sound like a huge gaming hipster. I think Reggie's got an answer for you. Oh, I hate this modifier, Reggie. I'm gonna I'm gonna k-word you. It's a reference to Eve Online. Oh, I see. Nice. Eve is one of those games where Oof. I feel like you can't just like casually get into it mm -mm. <laughs> it's like a real economy so right it's so huge and robust mm -hmm. and the people who play it have played it for so long that's like hey I'm, you can't just like wake up one morning and be like i'm gonna play eve now like, <laughs> congratulations you know it's like a, a normal person walking into like the whatever hello nawa <laughs> Oh my god, Reggie, at least at least when you die in EVE Online, you can come back from the war. When you when it happens... <laughs> uh, my moderator, uh, Kizushi Dayo, that is Nawa. Mad, mad respect to the EVE players for, for getting someone involved in that. Not in a null sec war? What is a null sec war? Oh my gosh. By the way, I gotta do this real quick. Let's see if this works. Nightbot, you there? Nightbot is live. Thank you, Neon nice. Bath, for the follow. I hope they're not one of those. Oh, neon. I don't know who that is. <laughs> <laughs> Though I do have to yeah. shout out a few people. I know Elite from what was it like Swag Squad followed the other day, and then Kira twenty seven, Angelus X, Yo it's Munir, Neon Bath. Thank you all for the follows. I hope you enjoy this special stream with Kyle Mercury. Aw, there's a little like colon three face i i turned off some of the channel rewards so that i don't have to be uh beholden to chat's demands that i woo but <laughs> if you want me to i will kyle oh no it's <laughs> so okay meeting darren so, yes uh that was the beatles rock band launch uh, mm -hmm. I was at that time I was so the I was with Viacom after Yo, Viacom. <laughs> yeah. So I was specifically specifically MTV games. MTV had a games division? And oh right, that's MTV right. Games owned a huge thing. They did. That's uh, right. You were telling me about how they yeah, too. I gotcha, I gotcha. So they owned a huge stake in harmonics. Okay. Uh, Wait, your professor worked on... No, 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 Reggie's doing a meme. You know the meme my uncle worked at Nintendo? Oh. It wouldn't surprise me if some of the, the some of the people who worked on Rock Band Green Day... Wait, for I real, your professor? The very first PAX East. It wouldn't surprise me if they were teachers. <laughs> oh, that makes... Yeah, you're right. That makes sense. Oh, who was it? <laughs> who was it? Name drop him. Name drop him, Reggie. <laughs> 
I sorry, I thought it was a meme. I thought you were like playing with me. Oh shit. Ah oh, fuck. That is a lot of damage. Well, we, I, oh I was, fuck. I launched Rock Band Green Day at yeah, the very first PAX East. We rebuilt CBGB's downstairs at the convention center. <laughs> Michael Boyle. Nice. Just oh I saw, shit. I have photos from that premiere. <laughs> Just for everybody in chat, I gotta say, you know, with all the lore that Kyle's dropping, it's way too specific for him to just be, like, lying and making all this up. And the fact that he has photos, and that Darren is his mutual on Twitter, I am inclined to believe this man. I mean, you can go beat Rock Band and see my name in face. <laughs> <if you want. laughs> I mean, <laughs> um, let me do a quick shout out to you, though, on Twitter. I think that's the best place to reach you. So let me just throw down your link so people see... That yes, this man is in fact who he says he is. And if you want to put your website, Green, Green by all Day, means. Green Day Rock Band was really divisive <laughs> inside of Harmonix for a while. I think I only played like the. I think I played Guitar Hero before Rock Band. You've seen the proof? Yeah. We had launched. We had launched Beatles Rock Band. It's like, where do you go from there? It's like <laughs> Beatles. And then the next game we do is Green Day, and people are like, what? How do you go from the Beatles to Green Day? Like, what is that? What's the logic there? Uh, the logic there is that there's only so many rock songs in the world. <laughs> oh, crap. Well, the logic there is also MTV. Again, MTV Games at the time still has a huge stake in harmonics. And the clout that MTV has when it comes to getting licensed music is unparalleled. That is fair. That is fair. That makes a lot of sense. Oh, crap. Not the ninjas. Not the ninjas. First rock band, you'd know that there's a lot of covers in the first rock band. Uh, Kyle, may I take a moment? Two, a lot of those moves are, a lot of those tracks are remastered with the original songs, and that's because MTV gets involved in making it the licensing to anything. May I take a moment? A lot of people didn't have <laughs> Metallica. Here's a fun fact about Harmonix, a game that we never launched but demoed internally. There was a Pearl Jam rock. And it never, as far as I know, it never launched. <laughs> that was a thing. Um, I, I just want to, so... yes, go on. <laughs> no, what's up? No, 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 no. I, I, I wasn't even going to add anything of value. I just wanted to complain that I literally at Facebook, Apple, Microsoft, all these places you've worked at, and everybody slept on this the entire time until you went live. Everybody slept on everybody slept on your interview. I'm sorry. I tried my best to be like, you guys should come here, talk to this man, learn about the games industry, but no. Well, this, it's interesting. And we'll, <laughs> we'll get to that too. About the, the weird, circuitous path that you end up taking to get into these things. Uh, but yes, how did you so, meet Darren? <laughs> so one of the promote one of the partnerships that existed inside MTV games at the time was with Harris Entertainment. Uh, Harris Entertainment. Yeah, I agree with that. F Fuser is incredible. Uh, what is Fuser? I I remember that being promoted here and there for a bit. Fuser is the DJ version of basically a rock band. That was that was an idea even back when I worked there. People That's were, so cool. We're hot on that. Like you do the actual uh, like table mixing and stuff like that. Yep, you can pull stems and all from all different kinds of songs and weave them together to create your own track. It's kind of unbelievable. It's super hype. Uh, yep, drop mix. I demo drop mix. Drop mix. We had the beta early, early, early beta versions of drop mix when I was still at Harmonix. Like the idea of making a card game. <clears throat> After Rock Band 3 and Dance Central 2, uh, there was a lot of sort of internal testing at Harmonix mm -hmm. about what should we do next, what should we do next, what should right. we do next. So that's where all these ideas like drop mix and stuff uh, all came from that sort of giant studio-wide brainstorming session about where Harmonix should go next. Yeah, PAX is immense these days. Jeez. <clears throat> Oh my uh, gosh, PAX East. Were you there when they did the anniversary for um, Supergiant? No, I was not. Oh man. At least they had the VOD. I saw the VOD, not the actual <laughs> performance. I'm sorry, I watched the VOD at work. I shouldn't have, but I was watching it at work. <laughs> well, I mean, back in the day, Rock Band was a big part. Because the, what is the, there's like a 
PAX wide tournament that happens, and for a long time, Rock Band was part of that that tournament. Why does Reggie keep picking the ones that fuck me over the most? Because what fun would it be otherwise? <laughs> I will do my best to not d word. Omegathon, that's the one. What is Omegathon? That is the PAX wide tournament that happens. Oh, PAX wide tournament. Is that a bunch of like different esports games? No, it's not necessarily esports. It's just games. <laughs> uh, yeah, I was in charge of setting up all the the rock band stuff for Omegathon every time we did that. Oh, so sorry, I must have misunderstood. So it's not just like compet like the the big no, league yeah, games. It's, it's just people teams. playing like, a, like versus against like one a, another. Yeah, it's like a showcase. Of gotcha. That okay. Got it. I understand. Oh my gosh, I'm so scared yeah. that I'm gonna die. Uh, speaking of circuitous route, uh, so then, so one of MTV Games' partnerships was with Harris Entertainment, the giant sort of casino company. Uh, they do tons <coughs> of stuff. But they wanted to do, they were willing to sponsor a rock band tournament, a global one, where anybody could get involved. Mm -hmm. uh, and you could post up scores and make it to the finals, and then Harris would host uh, the competition live. So based on my pre, this is mm -hmm. relates back to the Nintendo thing, based on my experience with sort of structuring and building and, and doing <laughs> tournaments, I was sort of in charge of this process, this uh, Total Rock, Total Rewards. Total Rewards was Hera's internal program, so it became Total Rock, Total Rewards. <clears throat> uh, it was going to be a national rock band tournament. <coughs> Anybody could enter with a band uh, and post up scores. I kept track of all this stuff. We picked the finalists, and the finalists would go and play live uh, at Hera's. The prize pool was ten thousand dollars i think and like a signed guitar and all kinds it was just tons and tons and tons of swag and stuff so <coughs> yeah what year that must have been 2008 and nine maybe i don't even remember uh in any case so i'm in charge of this total rock total rewards program rock band tournament xyz i travel all over the country setting up rock band at different Harrah's, so people who can't do it at home can come do it live. Uh, so I go, I interview bands, I talk with band members, I set up songs. The first year was a big learning experience because you know you can't just open it up. You can't just say play any song and then base it on score, right? Because there are some rock band songs that have higher potential score ceilings mm -hmm. than others, regardless of difficulty. I'm sorry, just r roll back a bit. What do you mean by score ceilings? Like, because of how many notes the songs are in, you get that many So, there's an example is two songs at the highest difficulty. Mm -hmm. uh, even if they're sort of like, you know, five-star difficulty songs, one song could have a higher potential score ceiling because the number of notes or the way the song is structured. So when you start getting these like really, really hardcore rock band players <clears throat> coming in, they're, they're breaking down every song. They know how many notes are in each track and they're specifically tailoring their performances only to hit that score cap, knowing that's what's gonna take them to the finals. Uh, and that is when we baked in the idea of performance counting as much as score does. This is something I learned in all my years of taking rock band sort of around the world is that a lot of times being really good at rock band means you are intensely staring at a screen because you have to like concentrate super hard and hit all those notes. So that's really awesome technically, but for a crowd, it is boring as hell. Kyle, you didn't tell me that your your partner would show up. <laughs> That's neon. <laughs> you didn't you didn't give me a heads up. Thank you so much, <laughs> Neon Bath. I was worried that they were like someone, some random person. <laughs> no, they're not some random person. 
Well, sometimes random bots will come into the stream, but go on. You were talking, talking about your experience. It would be on brand if my partner was a random bot, though. <laughs> oh, no! <laughs> don't, don't do them dirty like that. <laughs> I saw the Twitter promo. Thank you, Neon. They are. Yeah, they're the best. Neon's awesome. Uh, so what ended up happening was Rock Band, Total Rock, Total Rewards became a combination of how, how accurately can you reproduce the, the Rock Band performance, not just technically, but mm -hmm. also in terms of how can you energize a crowd? Can you keep people entertained? What are your oh. onstage shenanigans? Like... Be a real rock band. Don't just be four people staring at a screen. And <laughs> I see what you're saying. This, yeah. So this threw a lot of the best rock band players for a complete loop. A lot of people were really mad because they're sitting at home like, well, I, I gold starred 100 percented every song in the game. I'm like, cool. You did that in a completely controlled environment. Now I need you to do that getting up on stage at Harrah's in Las Vegas or Atlantic City and doing that, you know, for a thousand people live. And that completely changes the dynamic of how you play a rock band. Uh, so we get all the finalists together. <clears throat> Again, this is year two, I believe. Uh, and who were the bands that year? It was the Ninjas in Disguise, who I'm still, I still talk with those guys. It was Fa K, I still talk with those guys. It was Raffle Mao, which was Darren's band. Uh... Oh, let me put that in the chat so they understand how it's spelled. Let me, let me write it out. Raffle Mao. Raffle Mao. Yes. Yeah, that was, that was Darren Corb's band. Which at the time we were concerned was a Chairman Mao reference, but you never confirmed that it was or wasn't. You you never confirmed with him if it was or wasn't. Yeah, we just ran with it. Ask for forgiveness, not permission. Exactly. <laughs> that is that is the funniest creed. <laughs> okay, so where, where where are we in the timeline? This must be this must be two thousand ten. 2010 of your extensive CV, you're saying? Yeah, so 2010, <laughs> was, the yeah, 2010 was the second annual. Uh, oh, who were the last? Oh, the Gurn Killers were the last. They won the, no, they won the first year. They won the first year in Atlantic City. They, those dudes are awesome. Uh, and yeah, we had Ninjas in Disguise, Fake. Was it 2011 was the next year? I don't know. It's, man, so much of it is a blur for me. It's crazy. Uh, it was a wild time. So this is all happening. And now we've got people on stage mm -hmm. going crazy. Like right. putting on the, the performances in year two are just blowing the performances from year one away. The, the people, they have upped their game. People are like, the stage antics. There was a tie one. Yeah, so this is 2000. No, it's 2010. This is July 2nd, 2010. Ooh, you right. have a date now. July 2nd. These are the timestamps for my photos anyway. Ah, uh, I see, I see. That's right, uh, you have photo, you have photographic proof. Are you going to... Oh, I have, I have... Are we, are, are we going <laughs> to see those on Twitter or somewhere else? Uh, I would I would want Darren's permission before I post a picture of course. him in little red booty shorts. Oh my place. god! You have photos <laughs> of Darren Corp in red booty shorts? Well, his whole crew is in red booty shorts uh, <laughs> because their, their uh, winning performance was Heartbreaker. How does that song go? I'm trying to remember. Uh, so there, if I sing it, is Twitch going to copyright strike you? I don't believe so. Not if we only do the first 30 seconds. Or is it the first three seconds? I don't know. What was it? Oh, I'm out of ammo. Whoop. Uh, and this is not... 
by the way, this is Pat Benatar Heartbreaker, not Oh Pat Benatar, uh, of course. Of course. Uh, not not Mariah Carey Heartbreaker. No no no. I, I assumed it would be one of the the yeah. Uh let me think. So yeah, no, this is no, this is, like the host was Sway, uh the the heads of harmonics were some of the judges. Like this was I was the back quote unquote backstage judge because I got to see the performance from behind all the performers. Oh wow. So Instead of like the show wasn't being put on for me, uh, but I got a sort of a, a backstage view, so I sort of kept notes on it and would relay those, relay those to the judges. And uh, in any case, so that year, Raffle Mao wins. This was the same year. I think did Darren mention it that he shaved an onk into his yes, hair? Yes, he did. In fact, distance? mention that he <laughs> went super hard and shaved an onk into his chest hair. Yes. Uh, that is they were that's great. recorded. I, I still need to clip that part, but it's he said it out loud, the man himself. So I'm gonna add that to that thread. I mean that this is the same interview where I had to say some really, really cursed things and he was gracious enough not to answer them. He was like I don't know. I don't know. And I think he was very taken aback by it because up until then, it'd been a very, very uh, professional interview. And then I, I hit him out of nowhere with, Darren Korb, does Zagreus from Hades eat ass? And he's like, I don't know. Whoa. I don't know. That That's the kind of people I have asking me questions. I. <sighs> oh, Science was one of the bands? Uh... Yeah, anyway. <laughs> hilarious, hilarious. It was, it was such a good time. The whole thing was so much fun. Uh, you know, there's, and there's sort of the foibles here and there. There's things that happen that always happen like live events that's just the way live events go there's no sort of stopping it see uh, neon has a... my side <laughs> wait a minute what is the side what what side neon said my kind of question to be honest oh <laughs> but go on <laughs> uh everybody's hanging out in atlantic city all the bands are so super nice you know they're spending their time between practicing in their hotel rooms uh and like hanging out with everybody and just everybody there's such an amazing camaraderie because at the end of the day everybody here is rock band fans uh and everybody's there to have a good time they're there to see other people's performances they're there to hang out you know i got an amazing crash course in tuning rock band for the highest possible level of play and that means latency that means audio like the challenges i faced with outputting rock band to like 30 screens inside of a harris while also maintaining game integrity for the performers themselves uh i learned so much uh so anyway that year mm -hmm. uh Darren and Raffle Mao, they win. They they were the champions. They, they, it was unbelievable. The performances were uh, absolutely just mind-blowing. Oh, I do have more pictures. Okay, I got them. You have more uh, photos of... I do have more photos. Oh I have photos goodness. of the Ninjas in Disguise did the Ghostbusters theme all dressed oh my as gosh. the Ghostbusters, and their drummer was the Stay Puft Marshmallow Man. Oh my gosh. Oh, they had uh, so much fun with it. We did casual hangout nights. Today. Alex Rogopoulos was one of the judges. He was the, the founder and CEO of Harmonix at the time. Oh my goodness. Steve Raymond, who was a DJ from Atlantic <laughs> City. Uh, David Gravatt, who is the president of a production company. It was just, it was amazing. Anyway, it was incredible and such a good time. Uh, oh, science was made up of the dudes from in any case, <laughs> that's how I met Darren. Uh, <laughs> sort of working with him and all the bands to produce this ridiculous national rock band tour where people just going crazy on stage mm -hmm. in Atlantic City. Uh, his team won. They got a giant check with their band name on it. Uh, when I originally asked him what he was going to do <laughs> uh, afterwards, I believe his response was i'm gonna get a puppy which i'm pretty sure he did uh, get a puppy a puppy like a dog puppy a dog. 
Yeah. So, He's a so, hilarious dog, or he did. So, so you're telling me that Darren Corb did this contest while he was like in his freaking red booty shorts and and his his onk chest hair, and then he's like, "Oh, I'm gonna get a puppy," looking like that. Yeah. <laughs> no, I don't know how much I don't know how much of that 10k went to the development of Bastion afterwards, but <laughs> and then we always we know, we stayed in touch since. Like I saw, him, I used to see him at Day of the Devs here in San Francisco. All the oh, time. nice. It was really cool, just sort of like showcase of indie games. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he's just a super cool dude. So he's a fantastic. I. And I'm a huge game music mm -hmm. fan. Oh, same. So yeah, so he just sort of falls immediately into that category of oh, like I, <laughs> you're an awesome dude, and I love hanging out with you as a friend. Also, you do this thing that I really love. Are you uh, curious at all of how I met Darren Corb? I would love to know how you met Darren. Corb. Because it's nowhere near as impressive, but I still think it's a worthwhile story. So, what happened was that I was kind of like fresh out of. I was fresh out of um, my programming boot camp, and I was trying to find work as a software developer. And a part of me was just like, why am I looking only at software? Why don't I look into the game industry as well? And I was like, you know what? People keep saying, research the companies you love. And I was like, you know what? I don't love any of these tech companies. All I love is Supergiant Games. So I looked up Supergiant Games on LinkedIn. Wow. And I cold messaged Darren and said, hey, I really admire your work. It'd be cool if I could like pick your brain or something over email one day or whatever. And he's like, oh, I'm sorry. I like, never checked this. Here's my email. Email me instead. <laughs> So I emailed Darren Corb saying, hi, I have a few questions, like a question for you. And I, I think I asked him something about like, how do you like juggle everything and work in the game industry? And he gave me an answer. And then I was way too shy to respond. So I just left that email in my inbox unresponded to for like a year, an entire year. <laughs> so a year later, I went up to Dar I emailed Darren back saying, hey, I'm in a much better place now. What's up? Can I ask you more questions? And then Darren was like, why don't you meet me in Victory Point in Berkeley? And I was like, excuse me? You want to meet me in person? <laughs> so he invited me out for lunch, and it was my first time going to the cafe. So I had no idea what to expect. It's like a game cafe where you can rent out their board games and stuff like that and like order oh, food nice. and whatnot. So we had lunch there, and the man taught me how to play Yahtzee. <laughs> While I was grilling him about super giant games, about his voice work, about the music, about Hades development, because it was still in early access at that point. I don't think mm -hmm. it was even launched for Steam yet when I started harassing him with all these questions about his process. But um, it was a very stiff and awkward kind of like, let me go through my entire list of questions, sir. And I'm just like, oh, I want to get to this, but there's no transition for this, but let me get it in anyways. And I was so nervous. It was like meeting my idol. <laughs> It's well. It's interesting though, right? And this is a sort of a unique aspect. Maybe it's not unique. I don't know. Uh, of sort of the modern age or the times we live in, where you even have the opportunity to do that. Uh, like when I first started, I didn't know. The only event people I knew were the production managers I was working with. There was nobody I could. Re there was no social networks. There was nobody I could reach out to. There was so having the opportunity to very early on meet the people who are doing the work and kind of living the life that you envision yourself in mm -hmm. is such an awesome and unique part of the time we live in. Right. And that's partly why I wanted to have this kind of fireside chat. Not, not just so that, you know, I can be like, look at this man I know. No, I don't want to do that. It was more so it's not hard to network and it's not bad to network either. And people should take advantage of it because... There's this misconception, right, that you're bothering someone or taking up their time. No, a lot of people, especially like you, Kyle, and Darren, are more than happy to help people out if you, you know, ask respectfully, could I have like a moment of your time? Right. Well, it's it's important. And I mean, the what's <laughs> happened over the course of the past year can't be overstated that it's you know, arguably, arguably even more important now. But like LinkedIn is a good example. And I have never gotten a job from LinkedIn, ever. Uh, but what I have got from LinkedIn is the ability to have conversations with people who are in 
parallel fields to mine or in fields that run adjacent that I could transition or pivot into. <coughs> and, like I'm not, I'm not on Facebook. Uh, I rarely ever post anything on Instagram. Mm -hmm. I've been on Twitter for way too long. <laughs> Same. 2000, so it's 2021. I've been on Twitter for 14 years. It's stupid. <clears throat> uh, and I've been on LinkedIn for a long time too, but LinkedIn doesn't work for people like me. Uh, if you're early in your career and you're doing a lot of contract work or freelance work, the, the traditional path you have to a career mm -hmm. is different. Right. Because things like LinkedIn or even the traditional resume, like if I put all of my work experience on one resume, it'd be like eight pages long. Uh, and now when it's like every resume is just fed into a machine anyway to get pulled apart, or like LinkedIn, nobody wants to scroll through, you know, a 500 foot long LinkedIn page, but it's like, how do I get across to you the breadth and depth of my experience mm -hmm. without bashing you over the head with all this information? So the traditional routes in are not even designed for people who do contract or freelance work. And it's this weird catch 22, you know, mm -hmm. where it's like, oh, you want an entry level position? You need a hundred years of experience. <laughs> Right. Like, you know, that that's what? so infamous in the tech industry even too, because they're like, you know, recruiters, they're right. You need five years of experience in this one tool. Yeah. And straight up, the developer of said tool was like, yo, I I made this two years ago. <laughs> that kind of stuff has happened. So I'm just like, recruiters, please stop embarrassing yourself. You're hurting us. Right. But the alternative, <clears throat> the alternative is reaching out and talking to the people who are already in those places mm -hmm. and finding an alternate path in. Exactly, exactly. You know, I even, I think there was like an office manager for one of the game companies that I wanted to work for. And I was like, can I ask you about the company? Can I ask you about the company? <laughs> and I did, when I was looking for work, especially over the course of this past year, where mm -hmm. events just dried up. Like right. There's, you know, I was my, I'm sort of moved back to San Francisco with this amazing job offer in hand of managing the Palace of Fine Arts. And Kyle, you're you know, in San Francisco. Kyle, we could be IRLs. I know. We're practically IRLs. So I had my interview like the last week of February. And they're like, this is great. We're all set to have you in this position. This is going to be awesome. We really, because I had come from the Los Angeles Auto Show. So mm -hmm. I have a lot of experience with high level logistics when it comes to moving vehicles, which if you live in San Francisco, you know that moving vehicles are a nightmare. Uh, <laughs> so I was all ready to move in and sort of be the new director of the power of fine, the director of the Palace of Fine Arts. And then, mm. you know, the first week of March, it's like everything is shut down. It's like, sorry, <laughs> this is not, a, this isn't even a job anymore. And then Oof. around the country, events just go away. I'm, I challenge anybody who's seen a live concert in the past year. It's just, it's devastating for people in my industry uh, and performers as well. Everybody who had to watch, like, even uh, Games Done Quick was all online this year. And it's like, it's so hard to capture the energy of what GDQ is like. Mm -hmm. in, like, it's so good <laughs> when you're there live in this audience, like cheering and screaming. Uh, I produced Evo a couple years and there's nothing. I've never produced an event that has the kind of energy mm -hmm. that Evo has during the grand finals. It's unbelievable. What is Evo? Do you mind explaining for all of us? Evo is the World <laughs> Fighting Game Championships. Uh, it typically happens in Vegas every year. Uh huh. And it is just the the pinnacle of hype. <laughs> The pinnacle yeah. of hype. So when you, you say you fighting have... games, you're talking about like Street Fighter, uh, even like Killer Blaze Blue and, and Soul Calibur, yeah. all those. Yep. Guilty Gear. I know I can name drop games. I don't. I don't play them, but <laughs> I, I played Soul Calibur so, as a kid. But go on. That the the energy and I I was also an event photographer for Evo, so trying to catch ah, I see. Is a big deal. But like it's just it's. It's crazy. Like, it's just so intense and so hype, and you just can't help it. Like, caught up in the wave. Uh, 
and nobody's had that for a year. <laughs> it's <laughs> devastating. Yeah, I to be to be honest with you, I've never gone to like a big, big, big convention outside of say, um, "Hello, Sim. It's my Simpa. He's here." Um, <laughs> I haven't been to one of those kinds of events outside of like the anime kind of sphere of things, you know. Um, I I went to Fanime maybe twice and then Anime Expo once and that's that's it. That is all I know about conventions. So, it's so funny. Comic Con in Paris is heavily wow. heavily anime focused. That flex just now. <laughs> that flex just now. Uh, I've got tons of amazing photos from Comic Con in Paris. I didn't even realize Comic Con had a Paris version of it. it oh, it's. It's unbelievable. Wait, can I ask you something, Kyle? Yeah. Could you give me a ticket to GDC? Uh, probably. <laughs> I mean, but I'm usually I was... there hanging out anyway, so. I did not expect you to say that you could. I was totally just saying it just to say it. Oh my god. <laughs> GDC is a great example, though. GDC is great. <laughs> like, that is that is where, where the again, I think you probably know this. The people who make the games, that's where they hang out. Yeah, uh, yeah, I anyway, mean, you know... I love, I love GDC for how niche it is. It's like, I want to... I need to learn about the bitrate of audio as it streams through a Twitch-supported game on X platform. There's a panel for it. Like, GDC is incredible like that. <laughs> uh, super fun. Super... GDC is awesome. Uh... I think it's cool even that they hold like a little mini GDC for all us like Irvine kids. Oh really? That's awesome. You haven't heard of that? Yeah, they brought, no, I, I, I swore one. they brought Chris Avalon to like talk to us for like a little panel and Courtney Taylor was there. Do you know Courtney, Ta Court Courtney Taylor? That name is super familiar, but I'm gonna have to say no. <laughs> uh, she was Ada Wong. She voiced Ada Wong. Oh, awesome. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I got her autograph. I was actually going to tweet out a photo of my poster. So I told you the story, didn't I? No. I have to tell you the story. So <laughs> I went to the mini GDC at UCI and some pretty awesome stuff happened there. First of all, I, I love Resident Evil and I wasn't expecting there to be a voice yeah. actor from the series there. So I was like, oh, oh my gosh, Courtney Taylor's here. I don't know who she voiced. <gasps> Ada Wong? So, you know, that was the reaction, right? <laughs> and then I I just went straight there after class. I didn't bring my notebook. I didn't bring paper. I didn't bring anything. Hello, Sam Unhinged. Thank you for the follow. Um, oh? Uh-oh. Nightbot said Sam has no rights. I'm so sorry. Ignore that, Sam. I, I'll fix it later. But a uh, shout out to this is not Nightbot. Nightbot, please. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll fight the bot later. So I went to the mini GDC. I, I didn't bring anything with me. I just had like the clothes on my back and I was like, let's do it. Let's go. Chris Avalon was there like talking about Obsidian. And <laughs> here, here's the fun part. Here's the fun part. Courtney Taylor was doing autographs and I had nothing for her to sign. But I swear there were like re uh, refreshments there. So I, um, uh, you stole uh, her drink. no, 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 no. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, I got distracted by Sam again. So I grabbed a plate and I went up to her and I was like, Courtney Taylor, will you sign this plate for me? And she's like, Sweetie, no, I'm not going to sign a plate. And she reaches into her bag, pulls out a print of Ada Wong, and signs yeah. it for me. <laughs> so I. Ada Wong. I hope it was like super pixelated Resident Evil 2 Ada Wong. No, no, no. It was Resident Evil 6 model. Oh. <laughs> I know, but I was just. I, I love 6. So the thing with me is, I cannot handle horror games. And I, I never played the first couple of them. The first Resident Evil I played was 4. I think I was in high school. Leon S. Kennedy, hottest man alive. No, I'm kidding. Um, so, so I played four wow. with my brother. That haircut from Resident Evil Four. What's up? That haircut from Resident Evil Four, hottest man alive. <laughs> Are you making fun of his hair? Don't do this to me on my stream. Don't turn this into another roast stream. I can't handle it, Kyle. Please, I beg of you. I launched that game. You launched that game. 
I took Resident Evil. I took a Resident Evil 4 demo on the road for Nintendo Fusion Tour. Uh, we were in Atlanta, Georgia, at the Tabernacle. They have a huge event space downstairs. Mm -hmm. I took over the whole event space, wired all the audio for Resident Evil Ambience, <laughs> put up a, one huge screen, and played RE4 for thousands of people in this like theater type environment. Oh my gosh! Can I tell you how bad I was at Resident Evil 4? <laughs> I got I got stuck. I got like hard locked at the castle because by that point I had used all of my ammo. And I couldn't find any more. So I just I was stuck at the castle. <laughs> you gotta be an ammo hoarder. I was I was in high no, I don't think I was in high school. When did that game come out? Let me take a look. Hang on, I need to know now. I'm gonna Google it right now. When did the original Resident Evil 4 get localized? Let's see here. Uh, I'm I'm on Wikipedia. Between, I think between 2006 and 2009, that, those are the years I was on tour. Okay, for GameCube and NA 2005. 2005. Okay, hang on one second. Let me do the math here. By which I mean, let me Google the math. How old was I when I played? Res I was 16. I was 16, and I didn't know how to play a survival horror game. Okay. Oh no. <laughs> I was 16 in 2005. What's up? No, I was just thinking to myself the the timeline there. Ah. Uh, we must have had the demo in 2004 because it launched 2005. <coughs> that was a big that was a big step up for Nintendo. That was <laughs> a, playing a third party game on a first party tour was a big deal. That, yeah. Uh, and you know, I think Resident Evil Four. They never allowed it to play Smash Brothers. <laughs> That was a big deal to me, though, that, that was, game. That was Because <laughs> that was, um, that, my brother bought maybe, like, three ports of that game. I don't know why he did that. I asked him, like, why do you keep buying ports of Resident Evil 4? It wasn't to support the Nintendo, necessarily. It was more just to, um, well, I wanted to see the technical differences between how it handled on the GameCube and how it handles on the PS2 and how it handles on the Wii. I'm just like, are you serious right now? I understand now why you're really good at Final Fantasy fourteen. Wow, he has a raid schedule and everything. I'm just he's really technical like that, you know. But um, enough about me talking about my brother. He probably doesn't even realize I'm doing this. <laughs> Sorry. Go back to how you demoed Resident Evil four and your timeline because we we were in 2010 with Darren Corp. Now we're back in 2005. Yeah, now we're well. Now we're back with the Nintendo Fusion Tour. Right, where you demoed Metroid something another. Yeah, that first year was crazy because uh, <coughs> we had booked the headliner. It was Evanescence, Cold, Cauterize, Revis, Autopilot Off, and Finger Eleven was the lineup. You got and Evanescence was, for a Nintendo event? This was before Evanescence blew up. Seriously? So we booked them, had them on contract. They blew up in the <laughs> middle of that tour, and we went from playing like Fields in Fargo and Little Nightclubs to playing arenas by the end of the tour. I got a crash course on event production on that tour. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. Uh, but yeah, that was that was super fun. That was that tour was amazing. I had again, I had so we had that Metroid Prime demo, we had a Resident Evil 4 demo. Mm -hmm. Uh what god, what else was it? Billy Hatcher and the Giant Egg. <laughs> it was just like a lot of like. I remember weird. that game. I never played it, but I remember Billy Hatcher, the little guy with like the chicken hat. Yeah. Yeah. That was big. That was uh, uh, the creator of Sonic the Hedgehogs. That was his first game since Sonic. Oh my gosh, Sega, Sonic. Okay, I gotta look that up. We gotta name drop Sonic creator. <laughs> what else, man? So the first tour uh, must have been 2003. The first year was 2003. We had, <laughs> had, what else did we have? Oh, we had F-Zero GX. That was a big deal. The first F-Zero since the Super Nintendo version. Uh, mm -hmm. Oh, we had the Soul Calibur 2 demo. Soul Calibur 2. I played that. I got the GameCube version. Link. <laughs> Sorry, go on. Yeah, you could, in, the, in our demo, you could only be uh, Cassandra or Nightmare. Mm. I'm really good with Cassandra. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What else do we have? We have Beautiful Joe. That was brand new at the time. Uh, I, I snuck in Piano 3, which is one of my favorite games of all time. Oh my gosh. Uh, and then, let's see. 
Yeah, so Resident Evil, that must have been during the 2004, 2005 years that we had that. Oh, here's a fun, so here's a fun story about the 2005 Ooh, fun story. Nintendo Fusion Tour concerning third-party <coughs> games. Mm -hmm. uh, we're in a meeting in New York. Uh, Reggie Filame is there because this is a big deal. We're launching all these titles. They're getting ready to show off Twilight Princess at E3 that year, so we're discussing whether or not we should bring it on tour with us. Uh, and if we're allowed to do that before we launch the game mm -hmm. and we're taught, we're sitting in, <coughs> oh God. Yeah. We're, so we're sitting in this meeting mm -hmm. and we're talking about the games we're going to bring on tour and they bring up the game Geist. Geist. Uh, what does that sound so familiar? It shouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> so they bring up Geist and at this point, my, my job is basically to be the person, the the reality check on the marketing side, because the marketing people are like, we should bring Geist. It's a first party Nintendo game. It's going to be amazing. I had seen the footage. This game was not amazing. Oh, man. Uh, so we're sitting in this meeting. We're talking about, okay, I need, we need, I need to have Twilight Princess. Uh, I need Metroid Prime 2, at least some kind of demo there. Uh, please let me bring Smash Brothers. The answer is always no. Uh, and I need some other big tickets here. And I said, give me Resident Evil 4. <coughs> and they said, you can't bring RE4 because we have Geist. And I said, nobody cares about Geist. How can uh, you, how can you compare Geist? How can you put this, how can you put Geist on the same level as Resident Evil 4? Because, solely because of one reason. Geist was first party and RE4 was third party. And this was a first party tour. Right, that I see. I see the problem there. Yeah. So the only third-party game we normally had with us was <laughs> uh, Madden. Basically, the EA Sports games, because the install base on the EA Sports games was so big, mm -hmm. it was guaranteed to draw people. Mm -hmm. Anything else had to be internal Nintendo. Oh my goodness. So I'm I'm pleading with them to let me bring RE4 and not Geist. <clears throat> Uh, so anyway, we get out in the road and we were in Pittsburgh, I think. <laughs> Spike TV is there, if you remember Spike TV. I, uh, I, I want to say Mad TV instead of Spike TV. <laughs> <laughs> so, and it, Spike TV was like the absolute worst possible, like, Neanderthal man chest bashing television, uh, it was awful. So we to, we're doing a media tour. The shores, the the show is not open yet. Uh, man, nobody wants you to get through that door, huh? I, I guess we're just locked here. I, I, I tried voting and it's not letting me vote, so we might be locked again. I might have to restart it. Hang on, let me quit it and then log back in. Let's see if that works, but continue. <laughs> So we did a media a press tour. So the show's not open yet. Spike TV rolls in. They're gonna shoot all this B-roll footage. They're gonna interview the, the bands and whatever. So they walk. Oh, we had Splinter Cell that. Yo, year, I, I could swap to Hades. I could get out of Dead Cells and swap to Hades because we're in the just chatting category. Oh yeah, Hades. So Hades. much less stressful than Dead Cells. <laughs> I I'm really good at Hades. I'm doing a Hell Mode run. Watch my Hell Mode run. Come on. Let me do Hades. Let me do Hades. Um, I have to pull it up on Epic. Let me get out of Steam. But go on. I'm sorry. I keep interrupting you. So we're walking around, and Spike TV is just doing their normal machismo stuff. And right. And we walk past Geist. <laughs> and this one of the guys goes, oh, man, it's Geist. Spike TV loves Geist. <laughs> and I, so I, I, look over, I look over at the guy, and I'm like, I can't ask you a question. Just... For the sake of argument, why exactly does Spike TV love Geist? And the guy just looks at me totally deadpan and says, because they paid me to say that. Ooh! Like, oh! Like better. <coughs> and, and I was like, come with me and bring your camera crew. And I played Resident Evil 4 for them. And they were like, this is, it's, this is amazing. I was like, this is why Spike TV should love Resident Evil 4. And maybe not Geist for credibility purposes. <laughs> for not credibility purposes. purposes. <laughs> 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 
Credibility purposes. Oh my god. Oop. It was my job. My job was to know those, not just know those games. Of course. But to know the games that people were going to come and play. This is why I, I always fought with Nintendo internally about Smash Brothers. Are you allowed to say that you fought with Nintendo internally? Oh yeah. I mean, the, because at the, remember, at, this is at the time where Nintendo had accepted that they were going to be the second place. They were uh... everybody's silver medal. Mm, uh, I see. They had lost the fight between PlayStation and Xbox, and ah. now the marketing strategy was just try to be everybody's second console. Reggie is asking for a reminder which event this is. He's missing context. This was the Nintendo Fusion Tour in 2005, I believe. Oh, I was about to ask if Reggie was even alive, but then I realized he's older than me. <laughs> and Ooh. This, 2005, which is a pivotal year, because my team's job really is to send the GameCube out with the bang mm -hmm. with the knowing that the Wii is right around the corner. Oh my gosh. Um, how how do you pull that off, Kyle, knowing that there is going to be a new console right around the corner? You you get games like Metroid Prime 2 and Resident Evil 4 and Soul Calibur 2 and you just make them the crown jewels of what you're showing off. You roll into E3 with a Twilight Princess sneak peek. Ooh, Twilight Princess. You know, and Twilight Princess was a big deal because everybody was coming out of Wind Waker. Right. Was, at the time, super divisive for its art style. Mm -hmm. uh, and all of a sudden, you're getting teased about Twilight Princess, and it's super realistic Link. It's like, and this is going to be, we had announced it for GameCube not telling anybody it was going to be a simultaneous launch on the Wii because nobody knew the Wii was going to happen yet. Uh, so, that I mean, that's how you you really... It's possible. In games, it's possible. In games, even then, the mm -hmm. next generation isn't necessarily a reason to abandon the previous one. That is true, because i got to be honest with you, I wish they were still supporting the 3DS. I would... I would play everything on my 3DS. I am replaying so many things and getting new games that I never had a chance to get. Just putting it out there. <laughs> I uh, I was I did the Game Boy Advance SP launch. <gasps> the <Yeah>. SP, the <laughs> SP. I had an SP. My brother had an SP, and we would connect our SPs. <laughs> shell design, and and we launched it at CES because we wanted it to be viewed as a device, not as a game console. <laughs> Kyle, do you remember what Reggie's talking about? How Miyamoto wanted to uh, push for Link's crossbow training too, instead of Twilight Princess. We had uh, we had Link's crossbow training in 2006 when we launched the Wii on tour. <laughs> What's uh, Neon Bath? I play my 3DS when I watch The Sopranos. Yo, yes. So. I mean, I haven't touched it in a while, but I still need to finish PQ2, which was like the big title before it died, you know? So, Wait. I, hey, listen, I still play Destiny religiously, and that game is seven years old at this point. Hey, it doesn't matter how old the game is. I'm playing Megami Tensei 2. You know how old that game is? And I think Neon and I were just talking recently about playing uh, Pokemon Pinball, which I used to play <gasps> I on miss Pike, Pokemon you know, Pinball! <laughs> That game is so hard. I hate that game, but I love that game. I do love that game very much. It's I played a lot of Pokemon. I was the only Pokemon player on a lot of our tours. And <gasps> I actually, I was, I they lo I was loaned to Pokemon, the Pokemon Co. for a while when I was at Nintendo. This is going way back. So you were you were loaned to the Pokemon Company, the one that's now working with Niantic. Yes. The Pokemon so we did, Company. We did Pokemon Rocks America and Pokemon Rocks the World. So. For Pokemon Rocks America, mm -hmm. uh, we we basically rented an old train station in St. Louis and turned it into a real life version of a Pokemon town. Wait, Kyle, uh, Kyle, if you're into Pokemon, do you remember the Pokemon theme song by heart? I could sing the entire Pokemon Johto theme song with the additional lyrics. What does that mean? It means that. When the Pokemon Johto theme song that they played on TV has a, the real song has a whole additional set of lyrics to it. Oh I my I have gosh! I video game playlist. I listen to it all the time. I only know the um, 
what's it called? The the TV version one. Otherwise, I'd have to pick up or pull up the lyrics. So good. I'm, and I'm this pulling is, up the this lyrics. This is Ruby Sapphire days. <coughs> Ruby Sapphire days. The Johto theme. I'm thinking of the Kanto one, aren't I? You're thinking of Kanto, yes. What's the Johto one? Let me look it up. I need to uh, look it up right now. Go on. <laughs> yeah, so I was I was the big Pokemon <laughs> player. I was super happy. Uh, oh no! I, I read the lyrics and it, it started playing in my head. The Dodo theme. <laughs> it, I I read the lyrics and it started playing in my head. Yes. Do Do you want to sing it right now? No, I know I don't. <laughs> no, you don't. No, you don't. I learned I learned very 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 early on in my career that I have no desire to be a performer. I I will build and set the stages for any performer in existence, but I got no desire to be on it. <laughs> so. I, I have more confidence with the Kanto one. Do you want me to sing in your place? It's your stream if you feel like singing Pokemon. It is my stream, but you're the special I'm, guest. I'm imagining, <laughs> I'm imagining right now, somewhere in like Twitch HQ, they have flagged the words, I'm going to sing this song. Like, <laughs> a, they opened a door, a bunch of copyright lawyers are now staring at your stream. Like with <laughs> headphones on, waiting for you to start with. Stop I told, I told Microsoft, I told Facebook, I told Apple, I told everybody, "Yo, we're gonna do the DMCA strike." <laughs> Wait, why would why would it get a strike though? If I'm the one singing and it's not the music, I'm not playing the music. Lawyers don't care. Really? There are people who are getting copyright strikes for playing their own music on their streams. <laughs> Did you hear about the one streamer who got the DMCA strike because their blender was flagged as Skrillex? Amazing. Yeah. It's like, it's like with YouTube videos. Like, uh... Oh, Neon said speedrun a DMCA. Okay, I'm going to do it. All right, all right, chat, you guys sing with me, though. I want to be the very best like no one ever was. Dun, dun, dun. To catch them is my real test. To train them is my cause. I will travel across the land, searching far and wide. Each Pokemon to understand the power that's inside. Pokemon, gotta catch them. I can't do it. I, I, I bit my tongue. I bit my tongue. Okay, anyways. How many Pokemon generations do you know? Uh, the theme songs? Not the theme songs, I mean in general, because I missed out on Black and White, so when it came to Sor Sword and Shield, I was like, oh, look at all these new Gen 8 Pokemon! And people were like, that's from Gen 5, you dumb dumb. <laughs> yeah, oh, no, I'm 100% in the same way. Again, Oh I, my god. I played, I played Ruby, uh, <laughs> Ruby Sapphire, mm -hmm. and then... I, I keep track of it. Part of my job is to keep track of it. But once I transitioned to Microsoft, like I wasn't playing it every single day. Right. Uh, so I'm not. I, yeah, I miss black and white as well. Uh, and geez, I don't think I knew anything past. <laughs> no, not Crystal. But Crystal was. Reggie, you're older than me. How come your first game wasn't on the like SNES or something? I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I, I my first game was Yoshi Story, on N64. Uh, my, first, my first game was original Super Mario Brothers. Nice! <laughs> nice! I got a Nintendo Entertainment System. Nice! What was my father's first game? I think his was Pong. <laughs> oh, I guess, no, that, that wasn't my first game, right? Because I had a friend who had an original Atari 2600, and I used to play Yo. games like, like Tank and stuff like that. Nice. I, I can't do arcade games that well. I like play Pong, I'll like do a level of Pac-Man, and then I'll be like, no, I can't handle this anymore. Huge props to Reggie there for Pokemon Red. Pokemon Red was what I put. My best friend played Pokemon Blue, and I played Pokemon Red. Nice. I got Red, my brother got Blue, and then we got Yellow. Yeah. <laughs> yellow is the best. Wasn't that the one where Pikachu follows you around? I'm a Game Boy Color. Yes. Pokemon Yellow is the one where Pikachu wait, follows you. Wait, Kyle, do you remember Hey You Pikachu? Of course I do. Hey, you Pikachu was my childhood. <laughs> my childhood. The one thing, so where I don't play Pokemon much anymore, I do love watching Pokemon streams. Of course. Uh, especially of course. I, this, the whole concept of a Nuzlocke, <laughs> I find to be unbelievable. 
Uh, oh, I remember I dropped in on someone's Nuzlocke, and he named one of the Pokemon after me, and I just, I didn't have the time to drop by his streams, and then when I came back, he was like, yo, you're like the only one who's still alive. <laughs> I watch, I watch Mr. Fruit's Pokemon uh, playthroughs. They're, they're so good. That guy is a vault of knowledge about Pokemon. Nice. I think I was watching Arch Taco, who's like big on YouTube and is known for Xenoblade and stuff like that. But otherwise, I don't know a whole lot about Pokemon challenge runs. Yeah, no. And she, I'll, I'll give props Oop. to Mr. Fruit. It's so funny. He was a he got big because he played Destiny. Oh. Uh, so and then when Destiny Two, we met at the uh, Destiny Two launch event, uh, and man, people's a lot of people lost a lot of subscribers because D2 just was not what it was supposed to be and it hurt a lot of streamers and he was one of them or a lot oh, of man. but he's, he's bounced back <laughs> and he is he's excellent at what he does he's, and he's a super nice guy and this is Mr. Fruit? Mr. Fruit I have never heard of him I will check him out after this do you want to type in a shout out? Why would I? who do I have to shout out? <clears throat> Mr. Fruit Oh. Yeah. Okay, yeah, give me one second. So what you do is exclamation mark, then the... Oh, wait, it might not work for you because I'd have to, like, make you a mod or VIP. Or... Well, you are oh. a VIP. I'm going to VIP you. I don't care. I think you already <laughs> did. Have you been typing? Do you see your diamond? <laughs> My diamond. Where is your diamond? Your VIP badge? If you post in chat, we'll see your medals and whatevers. Here. Well, I'll... I'll... <coughs> So what do I do? Do I just You just type in chat, and type anything in chat, and you should show up, and then we'll see if you have a diamond or not. Put that guess to work! <laughs> I'm sorry! <laughs> I can pause the game and do it myself! I just, I want to teach, I want to teach, I want to teach you how the Twitch works. Diamonds. Yeah, you have a diamond, see? So I think I have it set so that VIP can shout out. If not, then I will do it. I'll do it, because, but I don't know how to spell Mr. Fruit is the thing. It's just... M R F R U I E Mr. Fruit. All right, I'll do Mr. Fruit. All right. I can link with Pokemon playthroughs. They're they're so good. He's so entertaining. Is that his Twitch? I don't know if it's his Twitch. I don't know if oh if if a shout out. I'm not sure if he streams on Twitch. He definitely uh -oh. has YouTube. Oh, there you go, Mr. Fruit. Is it him? Is it the same guy? I don't know. I'll quit till I can find out. <laughs> how many other Mr. Fruits there could be? I mean, people, what if they, like, try and no, snipe his no branding? Him, because he would have way more than 17 followers. Maybe someone tried to snipe his followers. This is his brand. Not the right one, it seems. It's a dead channel. That's yeah, okay. We will that. type the actual YouTube link. I'm so sorry. Let me delete that. There's, there's, the, there's the YouTube link. How do uh, I? Yeah, he doesn't really stream. He's more of a YouTuber. But that's his more Mr. Fruit channel. That's all his Pokemon playthroughs. They're so good. Oh my goodness. I don't know how to delete a channel or a message from the dashboard. <laughs> I'm a really bad streamer, y'all. Uh, oh, well, just ignore that. that. That's a dead link. Don't don't look at that. But anyways, I should have clarified with you that it was that it was Twitch. Not not Twitch. It was YouTube. Only ways a I'm timeout. Not, I'm, too, I'm too old to be hit to the Twitch. <laughs> I just, I learned this morning how to restream this, so. That is true. You learned how to host someone. And I appreciate you for that. Ooh. Well, Twitch was going to be part of when we started the podcast, we debated for a long time whether we should do YouTube videos to accompany it or if we should stream on Twitch to accompany it. Uh, and we just never sort of got around to it because the podcast <coughs> is so much work by itself. I was going to go ahead and ask chat which keepsake to take. Uh, so if anybody has an option, I'm just going to leave that screen up there for a moment. But where are Where are you in the game? Uh, I have reached Asphodel right now in this run. Did you already you already talk with Chaos? Uh, we did a Chaos Gate at the start of this run, yes. Okay, so you don't need a little <coughs> Chaos egg. What does the Hourglass do? The Hourglass increases the duration, the encounter duration of uh, Charon Boons. Do you have the Reflect Dash yet? <laughs> I was banned from using Divine Dash in my Hell Mode no. runs. Divine Dash is so OP. <laughs> Which is why my mod banned me from using it. Take it. Take it. Okay, you you know my mod's not here. I'm going to do it. We're, we're going to go ahead and go get <laughs> Athena. Grab that owl. Grab that owl. <laughs> 
Do we want another... Do we... No, I don't want that. <coughs> Ooh, Ethernet. Yo, was that like straight up Ethernet? Like, or is it Ethernet or Ethernet? It's like, you should buy Ethernet. <laughs> I feel like Hades is calling me out. I'm streaming over Wi-Fi right now. Wow, bold choice. I don't have an Ethernet port in my room, so it's all I can do. Uh, where were we before I completely interrupted you with Hades hours? <laughs> The OPness of Divine Dash? Like, yes, uh, the OPness of Divine Dash. People kept telling me it is like the best. We'd rewound. We'd re oh, we had rewound to the GameCube launch, I think, there. Yeah, that that is true. We so we, we, we went from 2010, 2005. Do we want to talk about anything in between then or keep going further? Uh, I mean, 2006 was the Wii launch. That was a That's, big deal. Okay. Let's talk about the Wii launch and why we're not getting a new Tomodachi Life or a new. Wait, that's three. That's the DS. Never mind. The Wii launch. Well, the Wii launch was big because we also launched the DS on that tour. Uh, the and the DS was interesting. That was the original, the OP DS, and at the beginning of the tour, the tour staff had. Mm -hmm working DSs that hadn't been launched yet. But at the show itself, no, maybe this was 2005 we showed that off. Because we, we had one under glass that nobody could play. Uh, and it was awful. It was, I, I heavily, heavily, heavily argued to not do that. Like, don't, don't show off the next newest, coolest hardware and don't let people play it. It was awful. Oh, uh, wow. That's... And I, mm -hmm. I just think we remember being in like, Cleveland or something, and I'm backstage. the The show's in full swing. It's been open for like an hour and a half. People are playing games. The music's on, and one of my staff members comes running up to me and is like, "Hey, we've got a situation. Mm -hmm. I need you to talk to this person. It's really important." I'm like, "Yeah, okay. Give me a second. So uh, I make my way out front, and there's a woman standing there with her kid, and he's probably like maybe eight, eight or nine. And they are drenched. It was raining outside. So they had been waiting in line to get inside this thing. Uh, and he's got like a little raincoat on. And she's like, hi. I'm like, hi, I'm Kyle. I'm the event director. What can I do for you? He's like, uh, we just drove here like two and a half hours because my son was so excited to play the DS. <laughs> and we get here and we find out it's like under a plexiglass <gasps> and you can't actually play it. Oh, and I was like, no. I'm so sorry. Uh, oh, and no. all, every, all of our branding, all of the messaging had been it's not playable. That oh. you can come and get a look at it. You can watch the sizzle reel, which I uploaded to YouTube, I think, <laughs> at some point. The old DS sizzle reel. Uh, <coughs> and... But this, man, this kid was so crestfallen. And of course. This is, like one of those, this is a perfect instance of where you, you have to break the rules and do the right thing. Oh, so, you, you didn't. You did not. You did, did Nintendo get I mad at you? Did DS Nintendo get mad at you? Oh, well, I mean, I had the DS because I was the tour director. I had a real one. <laughs> so I was like, here's what I'm going to do. So I got them set up. I got them VIP passes. Uh... I got them backstage and I took them to the green room and I'm like, don't tell anybody about this until this thing launches, but here, take my DS and play it for as long as you'd like. Oh, my heart. Oh, I love this story. I'm going to cry and on it, stream. I hung out on the green room couch and played on the DS. He, like All it had was like Picto chat and some of the, oh. the baked and stuff. Oh my God. And... I'd like to hope. I'd like to hope that that kid walked away from that experience and is somewhere right now, like developing games somewhere. That oh my that, god, that doing the right thing makes an impact. But that it was so, so important to, you know, know the rules so you can break them and break them when it's the right thing. We gotta find that kid. We gotta tell him about you and find that kid. I'd love to know how he's doing, man. I would love to know how he's doing too. <laughs> Props to that mom, like driving two and a half hours in the rain so your kid can get like 
what he i'm sure he assumed he was like a half an hour with the ds this happened a lot on fusion on the fusion mm -hmm. tour you would get 15 percent of people <laughs> showed up for the music 85 percent of people showed up for the games right of course in 2006 we had lines <sighs> around our building the people trying waiting to play the week i had signs made where we would count the number of people in line and it, the show doors open at what six let's say doors open at six so the show is over by 10. we would have to count the people what are you here for zelda okay move over here zelda over here zelda over here. oh my zelda. gosh we'd have to count out the people and be like okay the demo is approximately 15 minutes we can only squeeze x number of people in we have six machines running it times 15 minutes times the x number of people and mm -hmm. the last count to the last person who could possibly get squeezed in and they'd have to put a sign they wear a sign in their back that said i'm the last person who's gonna play zelda today <laughs> Don't wait behind me oh my god uh that that tour was immense it was crazy just sort of i mean i produced some big shows but mm. never the crowds that showed up to play and we had it early it hadn't launched yet when i had it on tour so these people were the first people to actually get their hands on this thing and it was just it was incredible <laughs> like watching people roll in for that kind of stuff working events sounds like so much fun the way you talk about it <laughs> Divine Dash, Divine Dash, Divine Dash, Divine Dash, Divine Dash, Divine Dash. Soda's not here. Don't tell Soda. Hybrid, Nawa, do not tell Soda I took Divine Dash. Yes. It's not my official challenge stream anyway, so I can do whatever I want. I'm playing for Kyle's sake. <laughs> <laughs> so, no, I... Listen, when I was a kid, all I wanted to do was work in games. Uh, you know, Wait, I grew up with Nintendo. what happened to I my Divine Dash? Nintendo. I got Divine Strike! Divine strike. I hit the wrong one! Okay, but it's fine, so Soda can't get mad at me. Divine Dash wasn't even in there. Oof. Yeah. That's okay, then. Uh, all I want to do is work in games. I grew up with Nintendo, Sega, Sega CD, Super Nintendo. Uh, have you worked N64 with Sega? For Pokemon Snap. Kyle, have you well, worked with Sega, or do you know people in Sega? Do I know people at Sega? I know think so i know there is a gentleman following my twitter who is a like community marketing manager and like i dm'd him because so i was like hey you said dm you if you're a content creator and i'm like at this point i guess i am a content creator even though i kind of think of myself as a gamer and just like, like just a gamer and then like i write things online sometimes and make funny jokes like that's all i do but um yeah so i messaged him and he he left me on red i told you about this guy <laughs> what is does sega make anything anymore other than Fantasy Star Online 2. Don't they still make Sonic? Oh, I guess they still make Sonic. Yo, that's that's a dig. That's a dig right there. Show, show some respect. Listen, I played Sonic 2 with a Game Genie. What the heck's a Game Genie? <laughs> oh, I could play Tails. <laughs> like, it was just like... Uh, oh, is that like a Game Shark? Yeah, Game Genie was the Game Shark before Game Shark was a thing. Nintendo is coming at us with their lawyers. They're gonna get so mad at us. <laughs> not. Why not? I, mean, I haven't revealed anything that's not unknown for the most at this point. Mm, oh, okay, no, if you say so. About the Wii. <laughs> oh no, we're talking of. Hello, Aether, Blade Mastero, I hear ya! That's that's my buddy who I introduced to my boss, who is now going to study with him, I guess. Did I tell you about my boss? No. I guess I have to hype up my boss now. I, he's I gonna get so mad that. at me about this. He runs ShineCon. Oh, nice. Yeah. So he's, like, I don't know, like, this big deal in Vegas. And when I caught his stream, I was like, who the hell is this guy? I don't know who he is. It's like, oh, it's a VTuber. That's cool. Oh, he's playing Smash. Okay, let's chat with him. Cool. And so I was like, yo, he knows these songs. He can do, like, a Johnny Young Bosch impression. Boom. Six month subscription. Easy. And then George, I, I... Wait, what? <laughs> what? What happened? Johnny Young Bosch. Yes! Johnny Young Bosch! He does a Johnny Young Bosch impression. Yeah. Wasn't yeah. he the, he was the original? You know what? I forgot about Power that until you said it a couple of more times. I was like, yes, Johnny Young Bosch did play one of the Power Rangers. Yes. Yes.
Then, then he became Nero, and he was and all these other and yeah, exactly, other exactly. He's he's one of the like old vanguard in terms of the VO community. Revolution but anyways, <laughs> but anyways, so so I I slowly find out more and more about like how big of a deal my boss is, and I was like, oh, I've been so disrespectful. I'm gonna keep dragging him. <laughs> um, but anyways, what am I saying? I, I gotta I have to do a shout out for him, or else he's gonna like fire me, you know? So. Hang on. Follow my boss. I have to shout out my boss on Twitch. Or I have to him. shout out my boss on Twitch, or he's gonna fire what me. A <laughs> um. So, what? Where did I leave off about his impressive resume? Where did I leave off, have Kyle? You on, have you been on your stream yet? What? Has he been on your stream yet? No, he hasn't. Cause he's an idiot when it comes to this stuff. He's Twitter illiterate. You got a you you got a whole sort of niche thing here going on. You should just interview game developers on your Twitch channel. Well, I mean, I'm not a developer, so I mean, but but, but if that happens, then he would have to face reveal. <laughs> I mean, I guess he could show up with his VTuber avatar. I don't know how that works. <laughs> Are, do you know about VTubers? No. Oh my gosh! Even I barely. I just got into it because my friend retweeted this like hilarious clip of Among Us with like one of these big guys from Hollow Stars, which is a group of VTubers. So they use virtual avatars, and they're very like stealth. We don't know anything about these people. That's so like, um, related to what I do now. So there's there's like the ones known in Japan who kind of interact with overseas fans every now and again, and then there's like a Western fandom of VTubers who are getting into it now. So ah, there's all this okay. stuff going on. It's it's, it's like, wild. Like virtual idols, <laughs> yeah, for, kind of, yeah. Know. But he just plays Smash and like talks smack at people because he's actually that good. Okay, so the first time I faced him, he didn't realize I do not play competitive Smash. I only play story mode. I don't go online. I've done like a couple online tourneys with like my friends and stuff, but I don't play Smash. Is the point? So he didn't know that, and he just completely juggled me constantly and like killed me like three stock. When I was so. Funny story about Smash. Yes. The reason we weren't allowed to bring Smash on tour, no matter what we did, right, was because if we put Smash in any console, nobody would play anything else. Everybody would go and play Smash. And that made third parties <laughs> very angry, and it made first party developers really sad because, oh, look at this awesome, shiny new game we're about to release. Nobody cares. They just want to play Smash. <laughs> and then every city you go to, you get the you know the one kid who walks up and says, I am the best Smash player in Cincinnati. Hi, I'm the best Smash player in Cleveland. Hi, I'm the best Smash player in Jackson. It's like, oh my god, Smash players live in a different world. This is Smash Melee. This is the uh, GameCube version. So, I, I had to be good at Smash Melee because everybody wants to beat the guy from Nintendo. They roll up, they see Smash in, they go, where's the Nintendo person here? I want to fight them in Smash. <laughs> that oof <laughs> the pressure well no but the, the goal is don't take it seriously so i played peach and a hundred percent of my strategy was fly around throw turnips and talk because <laughs> the, the people who take it crazy seriously will get so frustrated and so flustered they will end up KOing themselves because they're so tilted so, so I only know playing Smash from like a hundred percent peach troll way to play because embarrassing somebody who is talking a huge game and rolling up, thinking they're the best person in whatever city you're in, only to watch them KO themselves repeatedly while I'm just standing there twirling my umbrella in a circle <laughs> and hitting them with turnips. It's that was cheap. That's not a real win. Come down here and face me. Turn. It's like Fox only. Final destination. No and items. Then, final destination. Fox only. Go go go. But it's like no no no. You've stepped into my world. You are in my event. This is how we play Smash here. So you can adapt because this you're is a good how it player. goes. <laughs> or you can keep your blinders on and keep, you know, KOing yourself. That, to be honest with you, is kind of how I ended up playing Smash for my first online tourney. And I, I think there's still a clip. There might be a highlight video of that. So I had my face cam on. I had the Joy-Cons, right? I was literally dancing around with my Joy-Cons being like, oh, let's chase the materia while I'm playing Joker in like a like 
four person free for all and there's items everywhere i'm just like letting them like hash it out kill each other whatever and i somehow won because i was just like ooh, i don't know this stage is this the final fantasy 7 you know shout out Ooh. <laughs> but anyways go on there you go blade knows he knows that the melee melee peach is such a troll <laughs> Oh, this is Melee. I was talking about Ultimate. Dang. Yeah, Melee. Uh, I played... She's ridiculous. Her, her yeah. aerial, her ability to stay in the air, especially if you're oh, playing on right. a temple, it's so aggravating. They just want you to go down to that little death pit underneath uh -huh, the, uh -huh, the uh -huh. temple. Right, of course. And wail on each other until somebody gets, you know, rocketed off. But nope. Fly from corner to corner, throw turnips and taunt. May I share with you how I would play Melee as a kid? Go for it. I would choose <laughs> I would choose the white the white palette swap for Zelda and Marth and I would put them on the Fountain of Youth or whatever it's called the Kirby stage I think and oh, then I would just I would just I would pose wedding photos for them as a kid that's all I did is <laughs> in melee <laughs> I said it I said it's Zelda X Marth OTP <laughs> That, listen, that's the, first of all, in Melee, that's the Fountain of Dreams. Fountain of Dreams, thank you. The Dream World Overture is the track that plays there and is one of the best pieces of music from classic Nintendo. There you go, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> the Dream World Overture and the Hyrule uh, Overture. So good. Thank you so much for correcting my, <laughs> my, 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 my audio typo of the the track name <laughs> just have to get that in there it's like i don't care that you're posing wedding photos you need to know the right name <laughs> oh but did that, well so here's the, did did posing marth for wedding photos end up getting you into uh fire emblem yeah it, it you know to be honest with you i think around that time my, my gateway fire emblem title was path of radiance for the gamecube I've never played a Fire Emblem game, so. <laughs> Why'd you ask me then? Because I know, it, well, like, Neon's a good example. Neon plays uh, Fire Emblem. I, mm -hmm. I'm aware, I'm aware of all the the people who play and sort of the the feelings and community around the game. I just don't play it myself. I, I I'm super interested. I just don't play it myself. At this point, I'm starting to wonder if I'm known as, like, a big-name fan in the fandom, if only because of what I did on Josie's stream. <laughs> Uh-oh. <laughs> so in, I want to say in like 2019, no, this was 2020 or just 2019. 2019, around late August, I had been like on the Twitter verse role playing with my friends and stuff. And this Claude writer told me, hey, Joe Zizia streams on Twitch. I was like, oh, that's cool. He's the voice actor for Claude Fire Emblem. So me and my friend go into his Twitch channel and we're like oh hey nobody has made their twitch name any of the like fire emblem three houses characters because it's so new that's how i got blathed which comes from dimitri from that game and so because it was my birthday week and because i actually had a job at the time i was like yo joe zizia's discord is subscriber locked what if i what if i broke the paywall down so what i did was gift the man a hundred subs So I gave Josija a hundred subs just to be like, it's my birthday week! Have a good birthday with me! Yeah, yeah. And then that kind of nonsense continued on to the point where um, I have given Josija over 600 gift subs from 2019 to now. Please don't do the math right now. Please don't do the math in your head. I don't want to think about it. I'm not, I'm not doing math in my head because I'm only vaguely aware of what a gift <laughs> sub even means. Good, good, good. Everybody else watching this right now is like, you did what? Um, but, so, sh let me, I gotta shout out Joe. I hope he's doing well. He's been having a hard time. Joe, Joe, if you're watching this, you probably aren't. But if you are, if you see the VOD, Joe Zizia, my guy. I love Joe. He's great. <laughs> you're fine either. Keep going off in the melee chat. Just, just, just go on. But, uh, so Joe is a voice. I've had, all, I've had I mean, the, my only other comments <laughs> about Melee are having to deal with those people at Evo because they're <laughs> like their own weird little insular community. Ah, I see, I see. May, may I talk about Joe Zizia for a moment? Do you want to hear about oh, him? Go for it. Yes, yes. Yo Joe. Go Joe. Joe Big Yo, or Joe, Joe Home. <laughs> um, 
Wow, really? That was his. That was his. That was his. <laughs> so Joe Zizia is actually the voice of Fox McCloud in Ultimate, which I think is after your time. Oh. Yes. After my time, you talk like I'm dead. No, 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 no. I saw. I mean, like after your time with Nintendo, please. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Rest in peace, Kyle. Rest in peace. Yeah, no. yeah, uh, I'm sorry I killed you off on my stream. Yeah. I didn't realize I was being invited here to get assassinated. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> okay. Oh, I am, I'm clipping the mic. I need to lower my voice. I'm sorry. I'm really loud. Uh, so, Josesia, I think, interacted with my friend's Claude account because they posted a meme of, like, Rhea at the fire pyre, like, a pie or something but like we, we used to be able to communicate with joe via twitter before he like blew up and got like eighty thousand followers or something ridiculous like that so he's he's blown up and what happened was when he started doing his fire emblem streams that's when he took off that's when people start following him that's when he became like a big name like triple a title like boom 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 joe zizia is like a household name almost but um triple a title like smash brothers is not <laughs> quadruple a title quadruple a title right but i mean smash brothers right now is video like, games yes video. He, he yes he's the voice of fox mccloud but nobody cares about that in smash in a smash community you know but you go into a narrative game like fire emblem where you can right. romance his character when you can marry joe zisha's voice then people start caring <laughs> or you can marry fox mccloud <laughs> <laughs> someone please clip that anyways um so Joe was kind of blown away by the reception to his role in Fire Emblem. He used to upload a bunch of parkour videos on YouTube. He used to do, like, voice acting lessons on YouTube. Wait, parkour videos? Like, jumping off buildings and stuff? Yeah, he, he does parkour. He's, like, a really cool dude. He used to surf for the Air Force. Thank you for your service, Joe. I didn't realize the Air Force had a parkour division. No, 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 no. Those two separate things. Sorry. The oh. parkour <laughs> is a hobby of his. He served... I think he reached a captain. He's a captain. Oh, Let me awesome. just like unload the jaw onto you guys. No, but uh, so so. Anyways, I owe Joe basically everything because he brought me onto his channel once because I asked him like I was like, "Hey, Joe, you're really cool. Could I pay you to interview you? Because I'm interested in going into the games industry and like making my own game company." And he's like, "No, I'm not going to charge you for that. Let's do like a subs only event." I was like, "Okay." So I had no idea what I was doing. I had to call in. I didn't have Zoom set up, I didn't have Discord set up, I didn't have a headset or anything. I called him on my phone. And so... Oh, are you are you speaking to chat now because I'm going off about Joe? I'm so <laughs> Oof. Favorite FG community? Fighting game? Oh, for the chat. Okay. Where did I leave off? Joe. <laughs> Calm down. Oof. So, Joe Zizia brought me onto his channel to interview him about like vo voice over industry like misconceptions uh how things work whether they're like contractors things like that because i i didn't want to be a voice actor i wanted to be a person who would eventually at some point in my career hire voice actors you know Ooh, <clears throat> casting director that's awesome not casting director i'd be the founder of a game company oh i have to do everything sir <laughs> <laughs> i mean I guess Dream Big or Joe Home. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> Thank you. So, um, anyways, I, I, I was asking him, like, what it's like. What the, because I had his him as a comparison. Like, he's, like, more of the traditional versus super giant, where a lot of them are in-house. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like figuring out, like, where that spectrum is, what's going on here. And, you know, his community loved it. They are like... Ren, you killed it. You were so good on the interview. I was like, what are you talking about? I was super nervous. Like, he had to call me before the interview. I was like, you got this? You good? I was like, I'm so nervous. I'm sorry to bother you like a fan. He's like, I don't consider you a fan. You're like, you're a professional like me. I was like, you're not no. Fan. <laughs> <laughs> um, so there was that kind of dynamic between us. And, you know, I, I was able to like riff on him a little. And we like played off each other. And it was a lot of fun. And I'm kind of sad that I haven't done a part two with him. Um, because I was a nobody at the time. However, however, I think um, what happened was we did the interview, he went back to gaming for a little bit, and then I pulled up Hades while I was st still in early access, and everybody's like, Joe, Joe, Ren is live, Ren is live, we have to raid Ren. 
Raid Ren for doing the interview. Come on, come on, come on, come on. And so to this day, to this day, I have not broken that record of a 392 person raid. I think Joe Zija yeah. is the reason I became an affiliate so fast. Nice. But I, I also have to make a joke that I paid for my followers. <laughs> uh, you bought all these people? I gave them gift subs. I gave them gift subs. <laughs> I mean, it wasn't with the intention of building my own channel because what happened was I was in a really tough spot, not financially, but just like career wise. I was like, do I really want to work in property management for the rest of my life? It's good money, but it's kind of dry. You know what I mean? It's not sexy. Property management is not sexy. Um, so I was thinking, I asked my friend, like, look, what if we just like stream video games as a ho as a hobby, as a hobby? And he's like, yeah, we could do that. So it was never with the intention of making any revenue. It was always just going to be, let's showcase some cool games and let's become the next Game Grumps. Let's just be two idiots on stream playing off of each other. And I haven't had them on call in a while. I did like a Warframe with them maybe like last week. But anyways, point is, Shep and I were doing this back and forth comedy duel. They gave me so much crap when I was playing Dead Cells. They're like, ha, ah, you suck. And I was like, I know, stop it. Um... But where was I going with this? Why did I bring up Shep? Oh yeah, I just I joke about saying that I bought my followers. You don't have to follow me. Don't 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 even don't sweat it. What I tell people is like, pay it forward. Don't give it to me. Just pay it forward. Um, which is the mentality that I picked up from the tech community, being mm -hmm. you know someone who's so quote unquote marginalized. I'm such a token identity. I'm East Asian, I'm non-binary, I'm chronically mentally ill. I have like all that going on for me, you know? So finding a job in the tech industry has been very hard. Either I have never done a game jam before. I tried to participate in one and the boy, the boys club would not let me in. So no. Um, where was I going with this? I, I had a one month kind of stint in Silicon Valley where I learned about blockchain and that was about all that I have done professionally yeah, yeah, yeah. in the tech industry. So I was placed on a QA team. I was one, the first quote unquote woman hire, the first female hire, the most junior developer in that startup. And I was placed on a three person team and our supervisor left in two weeks to take a sabbatical. So I was placed on a new team. I was expected to onboard and ramp up with the knowledge that I came from a programming boot camp. So you can't compare my education to a four-year computer science degree, right? And part of why I struggle, <laughs> sorry, go on. <laughs> no, I was like, I can, I'll make, I can make that comparison. Right, because you, you're, you're non-traditional too. But um, even more so, like I didn't know what ping was and I was told to um, go on Wikipedia and look at what the ping did. And I was like, oh, oh okay, I'm sorry, I'm stupid. And then I looked at the man's code and I was like, I spent hours poring over his, his PyTest scripts. And the reason I had so much trouble, I found out maybe like, I don't know, two, three days later after I had spent countless hours outside of the office, you know, off the clock trying to figure out what's going on. I find out that the way my supervisor had written the code, it was as if he was trying to program in Bash, not Python. And I was like, oh, I can't understand this code because it's not, it doesn't abide by the style guides. That's how good I am at Python. I abide by the style guide. You know how there's the PEP standards? Yes. Yeah, he wasn't writing the code by PEP standards. I was like, what is this nonsense I'm looking at? I don't understand what's going on. Alternatively, because you have to know the rules before you can break the rules. Maybe he was so good at it, he decided to break the rules. You think so? I, I don't know. I've never seen the code. <laughs> I, I was Only staring at it. I was like, why, why would you? But the whole point of having Python be uniform as opposed to JavaScript, which is like, like just a free for all, Python has the style guide so that when you write in Python, everybody's on the same page and it's more efficient. <laughs> JavaScript is a free for all. That's amazing. Have you never written JavaScript? I I remember when JavaScript was invented. <laughs> Ooh, you just dated yourself, sir. You just dated yourself the way Joe dated when himself. When I started writing code, it was like HTML3. <laughs> HTML3, we're at five now. Anyways, 
I, I gotta, since you dated yourself, I'll make you feel a little better. Joe also dated himself in my interview with him, and that is when I, like, oof. <laughs> he said, oh, you know, when they do that thing where the cartoon characters get into the cloud, blah, 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 and there's, like, all this smoke showing up, and I was like, Joe, are you talking about the Persona All Out Attack? You could have called it that. <laughs> they called it Final Smash. Final Smash? Did they do that too? <laughs> anyways, anyways. I I am done on my Joe Zizia shout out soapbox hours. Um, I don't know if Felix is still here. If Felix is still here, I hit me up, but please, Kyle, go on. <laughs> well no, this is a but this is good this is a good callback. Yes. To you know, growing up and wanting to be in games. Right. But, you know, I'm, when you look at game, it depends on how you grew up. You grew up looking at games as art. You think that, oh, I need to be an artist to make games. You know, it's like, if you grow up <laughs> and you love music and you think, man, I love music. I have to be a musician. But there's so many other things around mm -hmm. those professions and especially games. Right. Games, I shouldn't say, games traditionally aren't just made by one artist. I mean, some are, and they're amazing. <laughs> but thinking that... We oh, can't all... We, learn... No, I was just going to say, we cannot all be concerned ape. Right, well... <laughs> it's, it's easy to get locked into, I need to have XYZ talent or skill to be in this industry or field that I love. No, see, what, what I- get into games, I have to be an engineer, I have to be a programmer, I have to be an artist. See, for me, it was more so the idea of, I want to build capital so that I can hire the right people to do all the things I know I cannot do. That was my vision. That was my well, vision, you know? Cause like, I can't good, do it. A, and that's a smart, that's a smart top-down view to have. But anybody <laughs> who's beaten, a major triple a title or even a not even indie titles those credits are so long there's so many other ways to be involved in games mm -hmm. that could maybe play to strengths that you have versus the ones that you feel crushed under trying to learn mm -hmm. and you know i found this out very early on like i'm i am an exceptionally good event director now the good thing is events is an enormous bucket into which hundreds of industries fall mm -hmm. and i got the opportunity to say i don't want to just produce events mm -hmm. and i've worked with tons of clients <laughs> in my life mm -hmm. i but i still want to be involved in games how do i merge these two things together and it turns out especially back again this last year notwithstanding there are game events like every week somewhere <laughs> Hello, Typhlo Ren. Ren's got to stick together. Uh, I gotta give a shout out to. Well, I can't shout out Hina because she doesn't stream anymore. But welcome, Hina Puff. I just gotta. Hina Puff is one of Joe's moderators, so he's got his eyes on us now. <laughs> but go on. You you invoked him. I invoked him. His, his mod showed up. <laughs> he MTA you. <laughs> So, and I've learned this, especially in my career, mm -hmm. it's like pulling off something like E3 as an example, uh, even without any of the game devs showing up, without any of the, the celebrities, without any of the voice actors, or the, the, there are still thousands of people working to make that event happen. Mm -hmm. And even internal at all those studios, mm -hmm. you know, whether it's Microsoft <laughs> or, or even, uh, what's the, the indie showcase? The indie uh, showcase? At E3. At E3 indie, indie showcase. It's not ringing a bell. I told you I'm not a big events person. The most I do is just watch the trailers when they come up. <laughs> it's, it's bizarre, right? Anyway, because I'm so, uh, anyways. Indicate, okay. Uh, and that before it was indicated, it was called something else. Even, and I had a lot of, man, I spent so much time working with those people. Uh, you know, 
and this is the most working with indie de developers is like the most satisfying thing because a lot of times you have multiple indie developers pooling their resources together to even get a spot on that show floor you know not everybody can buy fifteen thousand square feet and have a double decker booth you know <laughs> uh it's about so time I, for our intermission working, kyle do you want to take lunch soon <laughs> You're having so much fun! I was like, I'm not sure if you want to keep going and just take lunch at one, or should we go? Oh, what? I mean, th this is, I mean, the whole point here is just that there's a lot of ways <laughs> into games right? that it's easy to get sort of blinders on. Like, I, mm -hmm. I, I have to have this skill to do this. I need to have this skill to do this. Now, I mean, if your goal is to be like a concept artist or a level designer or an audio engineer, then by all means, you know, pursue those paths. Can I be honest but with you, Kyle? Like what my dream job in the industry would be? What? Hit me. I would be a character designer. I'd be like a scenario writer. I'd be one of those, like not necessarily quest designers. I'd be more interested in writing a character the way Bioware's spriting team had like specific people write the characters, the party members. You know what I'm talking about? Mm-hmm. The way, like, I think it's David Guider, oh, he did Dorian. Scenario designer and dialogue designer. Dialogue designer, yes, that's positions. exactly what I, <laughs> dialogue designer, yes, that's what it is. I have been in love with Dragon Age for, since it came out, since Origins, and man, when David left, I was so sad, but that he posted on Medium that sort of, um, what's it called? He did almost like an homage, like a, a send-off to Dorian that's like not sponsored by Bioware or anything like that. And so he wrote out this whole thing about um, Dorian's like very complicated feelings towards his father. D are you familiar with that subplot? Can I spoil that for everybody right now? I I, I platinum aged. I mean, platinum trophied. Uh, Inquisition? The last Dragon Age, so. Oh my god, I can't wait to freaking scramble souls into an omelet. But anyways... Um, <laughs> we're, we're, I love, I, lo <laughs> I hate that I love Solus. That's how I feel about him. I hate that I love Solus. But no, th can I talk about Dorian? <laughs> sure. Dorian. He's got better than Leon. Wow, wow! <laughs> You're going to slam on my high school crush, Leon S. Kennedy. Looked rugged <laughs> as hell in what was it? Regeneration. I, I disavow the live action Resident Evil movies. No, no, no. We watch the CG ones here. No, you should not watch anything by Paul W.S. Anderson unless it's Event Horizon. What's Event Horizon? Event Horizon is an incredible sci fi horror movie that. Oh, I can't do horror. I can't do horror. Terrible Resident <laughs> Evil movies. I see, I see. Yeah, see, Hina, I was talking about how 4 was my entry title, and Kyle's like. He was your husband with that hair, or no? It was because I said he was like the, the like hottest boy, like hottest man alive, yeah, or something like that. The hottest man alive. Yes, yes, yes. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry, my 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 brain's just jumping from one thing to the next, and now all I'm thinking about is that DC Douglas clip of Wesker doing the like we'll go live. Have you seen that? How about I? I see a lot of weird Wesker stuff. It was the one where he's like. And now we shall have complete global penetration. <laughs> no, but it sounds really on brand for that character. I'll post it in the chat. I, I believe we have to post in the chat. Hello, AKL Trifecta. What is up, Tricutie? We are going to post it into the chat. You all have to see this video. It is the one of Albert Wesker doing the bit. We'll go live. But I understood it's important. It's important, I guess, to mention that <laughs> RE4 was not my first Resident Evil. Resident Evil 1 was my first Resident Evil. So. Wait, 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 wait. We have to watch. Guys, you got to help me out here. How do I watch a video and put it on screen so that we all watch it together? Do I have to like... You're going to get DMCA. I am? But it's just <laughs> outtakes. It's a YouTube outtake thing. <laughs> Will I really get DMCA strike for him doing lines? I don't know. 
I don't know. Okay, you guys watch it yourself. Okay, when you when chat is done watching this hilarious video and you're done watching it, watch it with them. It's not a movie. It's just outtakes. It's a blooper reel. Trifecta just rolled in on this Resident <laughs> Evil 4 conversation. And... Yeah, everybody's all like, whoa, it's Trifecta! No, it's I played not Resident a movie. Evil 1, and then played Resident Evil 1.5, where they remixed the game. And then Resident <laughs> Evil 2 changed everything. Okay. All right. <laughs> so, please let me know, Kyle, after you have finished watching DC Douglas as Albert Wesker RE5 Outtakes. It is the most hilarious video out there if you're a Resident Evil fan. I will sit here quietly. I will. I will, well, I have it on a second computer right now, so I don't want, I'm not going to flood because it'll bleed into my mic if I play no, it. No, do it because then I can hear it too. <laughs> Because I have, I get it. Okay, I have the stream. Needed. Okay. <coughs> I don't need. <laughs> I told you, it's it's hilarious. You know what? If if you're all watching that, I'm gonna slap that bad boy on there. Guy, I remember the RE5 launch. <coughs> I need to get more tea. Kyle, do you mind entertaining the chat while I am away for tea? Go for it. What kind of tea are you getting? Uh, pff, this one is, I, I don't know, because the, the, the tag fell into the tea and it's like the paint, the ink bled out, so I don't know what it is. I think it was green tea. I am going to, I am very tempted to get my Gen Mai Cha. However, however, I might not have cleaned out my glass, so it might be all nasty and gross. Um, so I, I think what I'm going to have to do is get, uh, some kind of pu'er. I'll be right back. All right. <clears throat> No, okay, I'm in charge of entertaining the chat. Get ready, chat. Should we should should be Twitch chooses the topic of conversation now that I have control of the stream? I think I said don't have complete control of the stream. Uh, <clears throat> no, that's by the power of Hades. <clears throat> so it just I mean, I'm supposed to have this conversation. Uh, just about getting into games if that's you're, you're sort of M.O. And, oh, my free trial starts now. <clears throat> uh, there's there's so many ways to get into games that don't involve, like, I, I need to be the one to make this game. Again, if that's your dream, go for it. Uh, but every game studio has studio managers. Every game studio has event people, marketing people, uh, all these different avenues in. You, you don't need to know anything about games to be a studio manager, uh, but you spend every day in a studio where amazing games are being created. Uh, so find a path in that works for you. And especially now, we were, earlier we were talking about sort of like LinkedIn and the ability to connect. You can find people who are already in the positions or already followed a path in that was completely atypical to what you may think is the path. In. Hello, everybody. I return. <laughs> now, what kind of tea do you have? Uh, I I realized I had chamomile and I had to get chamomile because it is one of Dimitri's favorite teas, and he is my the namesake of my my handle. So, just oh. free gamer tip to you all who now want to play Three Houses. Give give Dimitri chamomile. <laughs> Hot gamer trip tip: Drink chamomile tea. Fire <laughs> emblem. <laughs> no, there there is literally a tea time event in the game. Mm. But does the drinking chamomile tea make you better at that event? It gives you more affinity points with Dimitri. Oh. 
Yes. <laughs> so it allows you to screw up one of his answers and still get a quote unquote perfect rating with him. So the thing about Fire Emblem is that it's not just a huh, we are teenagers that commit war crimes kind of game. They are there's you can pair them up <laughs> together. Teenagers that commit war crimes. They put that on the box. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Did they want to play a game about teenagers committing war crimes. <laughs> they kind of market it. They marketed it the way you would market um, Hogwarts with like the houses. Okay, you you probably couldn't sell that game that way because Final Fantasy VIII already did that. <laughs> Yo, you're right. Oh my god, <laughs> Squall mains? Does Zidia Squall mains? Who's in the house? <laughs> oh my god, Trifecta has good good taste in, in Fire Emblem gals. Mm. I love Annette. She's a great character. But to, to explain to you the whole tea time mechanic, I had to like dial it back a notch. So in Fire Emblem games, like all of them, there's these support conversations, which means that your units, it's a unique SRPG because all these characters have backstories and personalities. It's not like XCOM where like you wipe one and you just like replace them with another class or whatever. I don't know. Is the S for story? <clears throat> Uh, S is for strategy. It oh, plays like strategy. chess. The way BDG phrased it was, Fire Emblem is as if chess made you horny. Oh. Yeah. Unless you watch The Queen's Gambit, and then just regular chess makes you horny. <laughs> oh my god. I only, know what a, I only know what a King's Gambit is because of Dragon Age Inquisition. <laughs> Do you remember that party banter? I think it was Solus and the Iron Bull. <laughs> Where they literally played chess in their head. Did I? I didn't have Iron Bull in my crew a lot. Okay, then let me tell you what happens in Inquisition. If you have Bull and Solus in your party long enough, across the span of three separate conversations, Solus forces Bull to play chess with him in their brains. Mm. Like mentally visualize the board and the pieces. And so soul Yes. So this is one of the coolest things about Inquisition that makes me sad, right? Because eventually you'll find the team that you sort of really like. Mm -hmm. But knowing that there's so much dialogue that occurs sort of like naturally between characters depending on who you have with you. Mm -hmm. Like I I I norm because I played uh like a sneak archer, I normally ran with like Cassandra and Blackwall. Because uh, I needed the protection. Right, of course. I needed the frontline people to distract. Mm -hmm. So I didn't play a lot. Like, I had Dorian sometimes, and I had Sola sometimes. Like, I never <laughs> used Varric. I never used Iron Bull. Uh, I never used Sarah. Uh, mm -hmm. I spent the entire game trying to get <coughs> Josephine to abscond with me to an island where we could just retire together. Aww. Because <laughs> she is oh my, my sweetheart. Gosh. Josephine uh, is a sweetie. If I had to pick one of the ladies, though, I would pick Cass. I would pick Cass. But, uh, mm. yeah, so there are, like, hundreds of compilations of all the party banter on YouTube. And what yeah. I would do, what I would do is literally go to those videos, listen to the dialogue over and over and over and over again in my head to the point where I could write out their dialogue myself. So it was kind of like getting in character, you know? I, having having spent a lot of time talking with writers, mm -hmm. uh, especially like when it comes to Destiny, yes. like becoming friends with those people right. and learning about what it's like. And I can't you, you can't speak for every studio, uh, and I'm not gonna I'm not gonna sit here and, and speak ill mm -hmm. of Bungie, but their writers' room is always a disaster, <laughs> Ooh. Uh, and the game shows that. You know, it's not it's not cohesive. It's not like a Dragon Age or a Mass Effect where mm -hmm. the writing is just spectacular and you're you're hanging on words. Destiny is, you know, a chop salad of mediocre ideas that just happens to taste good. Uh, <clears throat> and the writing is part of that. But they have some incredible <coughs> writers or did on their staff. Mm -hmm. So you're you're looking for the good bits. You're you're of pulling course. out uh, all these things, then you're re you're going to talk and talk to those writers. Man, how did you even come up with these incredible ideas? 
know, where, what is your history? Like, we had a long talk with Seth Dickinson, uh, who is the writer of <coughs> a lot of the original Destiny and a writer mm -hmm. of the biggest expansion. Mm. And but he's also an incredible author by himself. Mm. Uh, he has written the Baruch Comerant novels. I see. And he's an awesome dude just to like hang out with and talk to. Uh, but the writing is so interesting in games because again the studios are so unique. And then there's some games that get by <coughs> with no writing at all. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's like a great one that I'll bring up is Hyper Light Drifter, where there's <coughs> no dialogue. Uh, but the game is super compelling because the world building is so good, you don't need the dialogue. I'm sorry, I got super distracted by some of the moderator messages that just came up because it's told me, you have added Samaras as a VIP of this channel. AKL Trifecta is already a VIP of this channel. And I'm like, I added I added Trifecta before Sim? Shit! <laughs> <laughs> but uh, go on. Oh, I'm, I'm going to clarify in your chat, not Destiny 2. Our show ended because of Destiny 2. This is Destiny 1. <laughs> oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> no problem, no problem. Uh, yeah, Destiny 2 killed our show because because they said, you know what? The writers aren't important. <laughs> oh. oh. People don't play right. our game. People just want to shoot aliens. And then they realized far too late that many okay. people, including people like myself, were heavily invested in the story. Okay, but like, what about Halo? You know about Halo, right? The Halo world building is extraordinary. It's insane! And like, poor BDG reading all those novels. I did a whole, in fact, you know, if, if you're in DGS, I did a whole Bungie lore episode that ties all of their games together in a cohesive timeline. Oh my gosh. Wait, so all that's of, all Marathon, of... uh -huh. that's Oni, that's Halo, that's mm. Destiny. Man, how do you feel about Anthem, by the way? How Bioware kind of, like, tried to swoop in on the Destiny niche and just... Man, <laughs> so I played the Anthem demo. Uh, <laughs> I, I bought had... it full price, like a fool. We will... That was... So that was a good... That's a... And it's interesting, Bioware really identified where Destiny did not come through. Uh, and they said, we have an opportunity here to capitalize. <laughs> and they did not. They really should have just stuck to their market, their niche, because that is what they're known for. That is what their brand reputation is like built yeah. upon. Right, but... After the Mass Effect 3 ending debacle, was right. anybody really willing to trust Bioware in the first place? <laughs> Ooh, mm. <laughs> Wasn't it because they got rid of, uh, what was his name, Kapsharian or something like that? No, no. the Mass Effect, Mass Effect 3, which is because the ending, you, you have three games. You have a decade's worth of content where you have played the same character no, no, no. across right, the right. sprawling space opera of a game. But and what I'm saying, though, is that because I've they played. cut their like lead writer, that the plot of P3, the P3, Mass Effect 3 dropped so many like seeds no, that have been sown. No, I put it all on Casey Hudson. Casey Hudson. Uh, the, the lead sort of scenario and writer there. Wait, 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 wait. We, don't, we don't want to rip on people in the industry on my stream. Let's not do that. Let's no, not no, do no, that. No, 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 no. Ripping on him. No, <laughs> but here's the He was in an incredibly difficult position. Sticking the landing of the Mass Effect trilogy is would be something I wish on nobody. <laughs> because you have bajillions of players who have had super personalized experiences from the very start, from Mass Effect 1, you like if you choose to you play the same character through Mass Effect 2 and Mass Effect 3, sticking that landing for that many people who have all had wildly divergent game experiences. Wait, 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 wait. Can I, one second, one second, one second. I'm going to swap over to the interview so that we're, we're off the screen of like paused on Hades. I'm going to swap over to the interview oh. screen, the scene. Okay. I'm worried that the audio is going to drop because it might not be set up pro properly. Uh, say okay. something. Okay, we good? Oh. We're we'll live. Does it not? Yes, we good. We good, everybody. Testing, testing, stream. Y'all hear us? Why is the speaker playing? Uh oh, the speaker should uh -oh. not be playing, because there's no. 
Well, you're piping through. I'm piping through. It should yeah, have, like, the pretty wallpaper now. Yep, 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 we're good. Okay, sorry. Now you can finally stick the landing. <laughs> well, the sticking that landing was impossible. <clears throat> now, <coughs> do I agree? And I think Mass Effect had its problems, you know, the changing from sort of like a tactical kind of RPG-ish to a more action game. Anyway, there's You could write a hundred thousand words. You could write dissertation. You could write a master's thesis on what happened with Mass Effect. But at the end of the day, sticking that landing was going to be impossible for the best writers. Of course. Uh, but boiling it down to push a button, get an ending. Was <laughs> <laughs> that is, can, can you even really call that like an interactive game? That's like a... <laughs> Well, right, but it's, it was... I take that back, and the, though. And this was a big deal, and I deal with this in the industry that I'm in now. The removal of player agency. Yes. The everything that happened up until this point was your choice. It's your game. But now you got to sit through a canned ending that takes enough of that, none of that into account. Like, it wasn't... And I wonder what happened behind the scenes there. I wonder if EA came down and said, hey, listen, we don't care. You have to launch this game on X date, so you better come up with something, which happens a lot in games. Okay, okay. Uh, I, I have something to say about EA. I have something to say about EA. I mean, they published Rock Band, so... <laughs> I have one thing to say about EA, and it has nothing to do with the games that they make. It was more so the fact that one of the ladies who came to EA to my demo night for my programming boot camp, she was super, super, super excited to meet with me and like gave me her business card and everything. And then I hit her receptionist or maybe like her scheduler or whoever it was, executive assistant. I don't know the lady's title. She probably doesn't even remember me, but I'm still mad because I spoke to her and I was like, yeah, I want to become a programmer for EA because, you know, your boss wanted to see me. And she was like, oh, game programming is nothing like web development. Are you sure about this? You don't sound very prepared. And I was like, ah, okay. This woman right. who was like super excited to see me, I'll never get to speak to her ever again because this person in the middle was like, you don't sound experienced enough. You don't have a four-year degree. You don't have shit. But she works in games. She, she was probably like a recruiter though, like in <laughs> like HR or something, right? Even studios need HRs and recruiters, HR people and recruiters. That's I know they need them, but but what I what I've noticed when I work with recruiters, at least in the tech sphere, like I told you earlier, they're not really great at identifying when, whether or not someone has the either the potential or the skill set needed to right. become well. And, but this is tough. This is tough because most people i would argue mm -hmm. the vast majority of people who play games are passionate about them right so when your entry into that world is gated by somebody who's not necessarily passionate about them it becomes less about why my skills are applicable and how i feel going into this and more oh you clearly don't have the passion that i do uh, that's what makes me qualified, and it's not right that you're gatekeeping me. I see what you're saying. But those people, their job doesn't depend on their passion for right. the game. Their job depends on like doing the... And you know, some people just follow the letter of the law with their job. Fair enough. It's really easy, and this is something that happens... I'm sure it happens in other creative areas, but it, it really, really happens a lot in games. And I'm sure you've probably experienced this too, and especially, you know, I, for any woman getting into games, I mean, you're immediately gatekept by dudes who are just like. I didn't even speak to a dude though. I spoke to a woman who was just like she didn't think that I would have the chops to switch from web development into game development. True, right, but her experience could have been that that day she interviewed 10 web people and the studio head came back and said, hey, will you stop bringing web developers in here? We need something else. That's fair enough. It just, it, it hit me, you know, because the her boss was so excited to right. like have me interview for her company because she saw the passion I had and she wanted to talk to me, but I could never get 
to her. Right. And that's, and that's, and that, again, you could be completely right. There could be a complete misalignment between what the person you're interviewing with is looking for and what this woman thought. I didn't even pass the for. phone screen. So, I didn't get through the phone screen. <laughs> I mean, the, 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 the game of telephone that can occur, especially mm-hmm. in huge studios, yeah. gets really out of control. It it was just like a really bad experience. And I don't take it personally, given how you kind of like talk through all of it. Like your perspective on it offers a lot of insight that I think a lot of us need to hear, though, because it, it's, it's not necessarily about the skill set. It could be a number of very human factors that have nothing to do with that. And that's that's one of those things I always keep in the back of my head is that it's all people. Mm-hmm. At the end of the day, it's all people. Uh, yeah. And you're at any given moment, you're going to be subject to, you know, the, again, a receptionist could be having a bad day and she's just doing her best to get through her job that day. Right. Of she's course. Still a person. Yeah. And it sucks. I'm sure there's millions of opportunities are lost because of that. Exactly. But, you know, we're, we're, we're all people. Mm-hmm. You know, we can't you can't judge another human too harshly for just being a human. I'm not saying I judged her. I just felt really bad because at the time I wasn't thinking about that. I was just thinking, I yeah. thought, you know, someone wanted me there and then I what well, didn't. <laughs> but and that aside. Is, uh, there's a great uh, a commencement speech by David Foster Wallace where he talks about this, this thing mm-hmm. uh, and how frustrating it can be breaking into careers or, or getting work when you're sort of subconsciously or even consciously at the whims of all these unknowns. Mm -hmm. And when your progress depends on other people and not knowing what is affecting those people at the time that you're supposed to be making this advancement, it's an incredibly frustrating human experience. I mean, but that's why I kind of decided to like work on my programming skills because I thought, well, I guess I just need the skill set and then I can worry about the networking later or whatever. But enough about the whole that. I didn't mean for it to turn I didn't mean for that to take over the chat. I oof. I'm no, sorry. I'm embarrassed now. No, no, but that's it's important. Uh, and it's important to recognize those moments and mm-hmm. you know you could go back, you could turn around, walk out the door and go, "Wow, what did I do wrong? What what could I have done differently? What could I what should I have put on my resume? What words should I have used?" But at the end of the day, there also has to be the acceptance that none of that could have mattered. Right. Uh, and, you know, you just happened to encounter somebody who was not having a good day or, or didn't think you were right. And that's just sort of the long and short of it. Uh, and you have to, you just, you push on to the next thing. You, you try to adjust and you mm-hmm. go, okay, well, hopefully I catch the next person on a good day or hopefully that there is no, maybe there is no reception at the next gig. Uh, and you're just going to sit down and meet with the people who are actually going to hire you. Uh, it's so important. It's so important, like getting the opportunity to get your foot in the door. And I don't mean that in the sense like, haha, like I snuck into the building and now I'm going to go talk to everybody and get a job. No, it I is... mean, I do want to clarify, though, that you're speaking like a general you to like everybody listening in, not, not just me personally, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, no, no. Of course. No. <laughs> it's like, yeah, it's, yeah. it's time for Ren to get roasted on the stream yeah. again. No, just as in a general sense when it, you know, it comes to some people are really, they need the FaceTime, right? Uh, the opportunity to sit down in front of the person who could potentially hire you and have that conversation mm-hmm. is like 95% of whether or not you're going to get that job. Uh, and I bet. You know, being up front and being per- nailing the interview, for lack of a better term, could completely, it, your resume doesn't even matter. I've been in interviews where the person looks at my resume, wow, this is really impressive. And we get to talking and they just like move my resume aside. It's like, it doesn't matter anymore. Like, okay, this piece of paper says you've got the skills that I'm looking for, but I need to, I want to continue this conversation we're having. That conversation becomes so much more important. And and that's really interesting, right? Of, yeah, mm-hmm. That being gate kept from that, when that is your strength, uh, is like a nightmare scenario. It's incredibly difficult. Oh, yeah. That, that's my thing, Kyle. Like, I can talk the talk. W- walking the walk, I can figure that out, like, on the fly. <laughs> thank you so much for dropping by, Neon Bath. I'm, I'm, thank you. Aww. 
Take care. Thank you for coming by and supporting. Go, go on, Kyle. <laughs> so, and that was actually interesting when you reached out to me on LinkedIn, uh, talking about like sort of the technical interview and whether <laughs> it's necessary or important. Uh, you know, and for me, I do hold, I've had like technical positions. You know, I was a chief data scientist. I hold a, I'm a technical event producer, senior technical event producer now. Mm -hmm. So I've had plenty of those technical titles, but my technical skill set, I would put in like the lower 98% of people who are gunning for a lot of this stuff. Uh, Ooh. Just, but, but surely by the fact that I'm, I have to say, I'm too old. <laughs> Again, I learned HTML3. I remember CSS1. Uh, I remember when HXML was invented. Like, you know, I'm I'm from the Jeffrey Z Zeldman school of DOM models and separating design from content. Like, a lot of the stuff that I studied in school is ancient by today's standards. Uh and my, fortunately, my career took me down a path that didn't require it, <clears throat> but I do have technical strengths and I do have, I'm, I am adaptable. I know how to learn new things and I'm excited about those things. So I'm willing to step in and go, Hey, no, I don't necessarily know, you know, I'm not a master at unreal for whatever the current engine is. Mm -hmm. But if you need me to learn it, bring me in to learn it. By the way, here's all the other experience I'm bringing. Right. That's what <clears throat> I've been trying to do. I've been trying so hard to, you know, tell people, look, I almost published a paper. I am good at academic English. I am good at technical writing. I am good at interviewing people. I am good at identifying people's strengths. I can do all of those things that you know, the stereotypical programmer cannot do. Because. Well, well so you then you've got a long search ahead of you because the, the key thing won't be whether somebody sees your resume and wants to hire you. The <laughs> key thing will be finding an environment that values all the other things. I don't, I have no idea how to do that, Kyle. <laughs> uh. And it's difficult. It's it can be super difficult. Uh, again, my current role is highly technical, but I was hired because of my event experience. And uh, that's why I'm wondering if I should actually pivot into like software evangelism. You've heard of that, maybe? I sure have. That's what <clears throat> I figured would be really great for me. But there, there, there's constantly, constantly that idea of you have to be technical to be marketable because no one cares about. All the other you know soft skills well okay i mean i i, I understand but in inv evangelism i would argue that technical passion is the most important thing in tech evangelism do you want me because... to talk to you about how the internet works <laughs> do you want to ask me yeah, that technical question internet, you're trying to get a job with people <laughs> no but when you say like you need to be like technically passionate about something, you have to at least understand how to well, translate the jargon into something that people will comprehend. Right, and that's marketing. <laughs> and this is this is where I would make the argument is that the ability to what you just exactly what you just said, the ability to translate the techno because unless you are just marketing or evangelizing to people who are already in the industry. Oh, no, 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 no. That's not what I want to do. I, I'm not here to talk to other programmers or like third party developers. I, I am here to talk about a technical product to the end user. So that, yeah, that is technical marketing. For, but that, that's what I'm sorry. I just spat out my tea. I was like, I would never be a marketer. What am I doing here? That, no, that is very, I mean, my job for a long time was <laughs> to take games and find people who don't play games and get them to play games. Oh, I can do that. D did I tell you that I converted a bunch of my friends into Hades? Right. But <laughs> could, could you go to Boise, Idaho and convince, uh, you know, a couple who are 65 years old to play Hades? That is a very good question. To be honest with you, I probably wouldn't even start with the game. I'd be like, how's your day? Like, how, how are the like, grandchildren and things like that? Like, do you want to relate to them better? Maybe you should play video games. <laughs> 
But now you're at you're at a technical event though. You're at a small technical convention. So I don't get to do the whole, you know, back and forth. Okay. Going out everywhere. How do you grab their attention? Ooh, that How is a very. How do you get them to try product? Uh, you tell me, Kyle. You're the one with the experience. I don't even know how to approach that one. The, the key is passion, because again, if you if you take all that away, these they're just people, and people respond to passion. <laughs> Trifecta is like, hi there. I hope you're having a wonderful day. Hey, want to beat up your dad who's six feet dad. under already? Play this game. <laughs> Trifecta. The scenario was a sixty year old couple. Sir. Hi there. Oh, you're having a lovely day. Do you want to fight your way out of hell? <laughs> you're going to end up there soon. Yeah, well, arguably, fighting your way out of hell could be a good way to capture people th this day and age. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to get outside and see the sun again? Oh my gosh. I think he was messing with me. So, and tech evangelism is not easy. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it takes this and this you're 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 riding right in the edge also of community management which is an enormous part of games especially now <laughs> that's probably not good for my mental health <laughs> well you're doing that right now uh oh you're, uh oh <laughs> you're managing a community of people who are on your twitch channel see it was it was fine until you told me that i didn't need to know that i didn't need to know that <laughs> i mean when i so at Harmonix, mm -hmm. part my event role was technically part of uh, community. It falls under community and marketing. Mm -hmm. So I was originally asked, other than no, I was being hired for events, but I was asked, "What do you know about community and community management?" Mm -hmm. And I'm sitting there going, "I've never managed a community before. What the hell do I know about video game community management?" And you think, "Oh no, wait! I totally have." Uh, I was the head of my Final Fantasy XI link shell. I had to coordinate dozens of people constantly to, to all work towards one goal. I had to take into account everything that they're going on and how we're being perceived by the greater Final Fantasy XI community and things like that. I mean, so, yeah. if you're talking about like me trying to funnel people to this this fireside chat that I had when I had, I don't know, maybe like a week's notice to try to like, drum up interest and be like, hey, put it on your calendar. I didn't even say that. I was like, I don't think anyone wants to put this on the calendar. Nobody knows who Kyle is. <laughs> no, 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 I'm not saying that. I'm saying that <laughs> if you're going to, if you want to get into like tech evangelism okay. and the marketing, maybe the community side and somebody says to you, well, what do you know about managing a community? And you go, oh, I have my own Twitch stream. <laughs> Here's the people I promoted to mods. Here, here are the games that I play on it. Here's the number of people in my community. Here's how it branches out into other social networks. Here how, here's how I've connected my Twitter to my Twitch. I also have interactivity. These are all skills for which you can market yourself to answer mm -hmm. that question. I had uh, not considered it that way because I... Oh, is Nightbot? Oh, it worked. Um, yeah. <laughs> I affected those Final Fantasy XI. And I gave so much of my life to that game. <laughs> Final Fantasy XI. Isn't that the one that got nuked? No, that was the first MMO that they did. Oh, they did the first MMO, and then they did four. Was it fourteen? And then, and then they, they 14, nuked it, and then did Realm Reborn, right? With like a really bad cut and paste of Final Fantasy XI, and then yeah, mm -hmm. they nuked it and made Realm Reborn. God, I think it's hilarious that they had like an in-game cutscene of it being nuked too. The Final Fantasy XI servers are still on. Last time I checked. <clears throat> Oh, speaking of MMOs, they are fan hosting Reimagine so that people can play SMT Imagine. That's awesome. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. I should be talking about Persona right now. <laughs> but yeah, everybody's here so, for Hades. And again, it's a, it's a good way, because also remember, when you're, especially in games, if you're going to go into games, when mm -hmm. you're interviewing uh, for a game studio or anything, the person you're talking to, like 99% plays games and loves them as much as you do. So calling up your game experience as viable experience usually flies. Seriously? Yeah. <laughs> I, I was joking about going to my hinge and updating it being like, hey, I got one question for all you. Do you know who Darren Corb is? Do you know who he is? When I just put his name without googling, do you know who he is? <laughs> but anyways, um, wow. 
So it's because those people they got into games probably because they love games. Of course. And sharing, having that shared experience, you're connecting with the person. You're mm -hmm. you are you're like intermingling of passions. But they may not play the same games. They may mm -hmm. have had completely different experiences. But the fact remains, you you can connect with that person on that kind of level. My, and it's my... not about, mm -hmm. you know, and they need to know that. Like, if you're going into games, especially if you're going into, like, marketing or evangelism, <laughs> I, it didn't used to be the case. This is where I encountered problems at Nintendo, where I had a marketing team who didn't play games. <gasps> uh, yeah, and that was rough. Uh, but... <clears throat> use like you make a make a human connection about this shared passion and you know they may not care that whatever you're number 47 on Hades speed run with the bow uh but the <coughs> fact that you care enough about the game to even know what that means <laughs> speaks to the passion that you have for the medium oh my gosh i'm gonna start crying a little bit <laughs> Um, I, was, I was told very early on in my career, this is, so this is like early 2000s. This is maybe 2002, yeah. one or two. Mm -hmm. uh, when I was in a marketing meeting and a lot of times, and I was ju super junior. I should not have been opening my mouth as much as I did. <laughs> That's uh, me. That's me. But a lot of times the, the senior marketing people would talk, they'd lay out the plan, blah, blah, blah. And then I would speak when spoken to. They'd ask for my insight on it because I had the passion for the game or for Nintendo or for whatever we were working on. And this guy who would end up sort of becoming a bit of my mentor, this guy, Craig, who now runs events at Microsoft's Xbox division. Uh, I was talking, I'm like, man, it's, it's rough. You know, I'm coming in here. I don't have a marketing degree. I have a technical degree. Uh, you know, I just love the games. And Craig said to me, right, but of everybody on this team, what you have is passion and you can't fake that. So when you bring it, when you take this stuff and you go out on the road, you're connecting with people on that passion level. Mm -hmm. And you're the only person I can send out to do that because it's authentic. And that, makes sense. that helped shape my <laughs> philosophy in event production, which is sincere enthusiasm because people can tell when you're faking it, <laughs> uh, especially kids. Like you can't take, you know, 15 people armed with Game Boys out to like the Nintendo World Store launch where the average demographic is like 11 to 13. Aww. You can't bullshit those kids. You they can't bullshit those kids. <laughs> you, you've got you now your your passion may not be the exact same thing they're passionate about but you can connect with them and of course that is the most important part you can't fake that oh my gosh that reminds me of a story i gotta tell you this and it might be a little bit of a sob story but i hope you all stick with me through it so i have this family friend who has I think a nine-year-old. He is the sassiest child I have ever met. Always gives his mom a hard time. I bought for him on my Switch account, I bought for him the second DLC pack of um, the Super Smash thing because I knew he played Minecraft. So I was like, hey, hey, Darren, I got Steve Minecraft in Super Smash. Do you want to keep playing? And he's all like, uh, I, I guess. D did you get Sans Undertale yet? You told me you can get Sans Undertale in Smash. I was like, I keep telling you, it's a costume, but yes, you can get Sans Undertale. <laughs> so he's just like, did you unlock him yet? Did you buy him yet? I'm like, I don't play Smash that much. I'm sorry. So I now that I think about it, now that I'm like following all these Smash streamers, I kind of have to play Smash more because I freaking have to get Sans Undertale's me costume or whatever for him. <laughs> and oh my god, the, the reason why I bring this up though is because <laughs> I told Lucian Dodge the story. I don't think Lucian Dodge realized it's me, but I told him the story because he was asking like, how much do video games mean to you? And I was like, hey Lucian, <laughs> this kid the one I name dropped, Darren, <clears throat> his older brother, whom he never met, introduced me to Borderlands, the very first Borderlands game. And that's like all that I have left of him is Borderlands. 
and it happened when I was 16 and he was 14 and to this day we do not know what happened but anyways I don't want to you know put the family out there um I have made it my mission to play every single freaking Borderlands game that comes out, no matter how bad it is, no matter how much it compares to like, oh, they don't have Anthony Birch anymore, oh, three socks, ugh. I am going to bust my ass to get through BL3 and like get through all the DLC and everything, because you know what? My friend's never going to have the opportunity to see those games, and he's up there watching over all of us, you know? And <laughs> he was such a fun person. He was the kind of guy who'd be like, Yeah, I'm allergic to seafood, but I'm still going to eat fish and sushi and all that good stuff. (laughs) He was one of those, like, you only live once kind of guys. And um, we we used to, like, get together, bring the entire Xbox to his house. I'd move from, you know, my area to, like, the city, which I'm saying very obscurely so I don't dox myself. But it's at this point, it's Mm -hmm. obvious. Um, So we would all 12 of us i think oh my god i'm just gonna shout out to them they're they're probably not even seeing my stream they probably don't even know i'm an affiliate but when i was growing up i had this group of i don't know maybe 10 of us 10 kids because all the adults all the couples knew each other through college and stuff like that so we would get together every single saturday every saturday we would get together to play they would play mahjong we would play video games so as kids we grew up calling them the mahjong gang you know and um (laughs) so literally all the kids we had a person for like every year all the way up so it was just like a a ladder of us and we were so dumb as kids we had the little kids and the big kids and i was an honorary big kid even though i was technically too young to be a big kid that that was what our thing was and when the guys got the n64 i don't remember this at all but they got the n64 and they were playing it and stuff and then i was just like oh okay i was maybe like six at the time and my dad took me to toys r us and he got me the console and I was like, Dad, why'd you get me the N64 all those years ago? And he's like, because the boys wouldn't let you play. So I got you your own console. So I was like, oh, cool. And uh, so my thing was, when we would get together to play the N64, all the cartridges and stuff, they'd be like, Ren, can you bring your console? Can you bring your cartridges? You have everything. So I was like, okay, because that, maybe that's why they let me play games all of a sudden. Um, you remember classic Mario Party? Yeah. Before they added all the like new rules, the new game modes, all the nonsense, all the RNG. Psh, uh, <laughs> when it was skill Book based. <laughs> Book Worm from Mario Party Five is still the greatest mini game ever made. Ooh, name drop. But yeah, so we would get together, we'd bring our consoles, blah blah blah, and when we sat down to play Mario Party, four of us and people had to like swap out. I think loser swapped out or whatever. They would play for second. Everybody would play for second, because we're like, yeah, Ren's going to get first place, we're going to play for second. Because we know that they're going to go really hard on the (laughs) minigames. And then you had to have, like, a backup box full of controllers, because you would destroy the analog sticks? We never did that. We never actually destroyed the analog sticks. We always got really lucky with our Nintendo hardware, like, it never deteriorated. I got an N64 for Pokemon Snap. Pokemon Snap, the sequel! The sequel was announced! I know, because I had friends working at Blockbuster Video where they had the Pokemon Snap printing stations. Oh my god. Oh my god. They had printing stations. <laughs> yes, to the chat, we did talk about Hey You Pikachu earlier. <laughs> um, but, but... but that... So, that's, so <laughs> just to rewind a little bit. Yes. Uh, the story about why you play Borderlands is an exceptionally good story about what the medium means to you and about how authentic your passion for it is. And that is like, if you walked into an interview and you're like, this is my Twitch channel. This is my Twitter. Here's my experience. You know, here's all the programming languages. I know blah, 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 blah. And then you told that story that is the story that the person walking out of that interview they could have interviewed 30 people that day who all have a similar resume and a twitch stream and a youtube channel they'll walk away remembering that story about border i'm sorry i kind of need a moment because i'm tearing up (laughs) and that and that's so important i I miss him a lot (laughs) that that's the kind of thing that 
that people remember that's connecting on a human level. I told myself I wouldn't cry on stream again like I did back in when I first started off, but here I am. <laughs> Don't worry, we're not going to drop the stream. I'm fine, but... You know, it, so I was... Nintendo ran a program called the Nintendo Street Team where... Uh, and this is early 2000s, where they would hire between seven and 10 kids every year to be like just Nintendo evangelists in their city. Uh, and the second year I was the casting director for it. Uh, so I watched thousands of submitted videos about kids talking about how much they love Nintendo or what their passion was. And, and I did a bunch of live sort of interviews in New York, which was my primary market, even though I was the national director. Uh, and all the, all the choices that stuck with me, you know, you're watching, you've got to churn through, you know, 200 videos a day. It's the stories like that where you grab your notebook and go, this person, this is, and then you, you go back to your meeting and they say, okay, well, who have you identified from the Chicago market? Okay. I've picked these 30 people. We've got to narrow it down to 10. Well, which ones do you like? Oh my God, this person had this story about how much this means to them because it was their dad's favorite game or their best friend who they lost or it's just, though that person, that person will take what we have and they will go out there and they will make everyone fall in love with it because they fell in love with it because they have a passion inside them that drives them to want to share. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> and that's, that's, that's what people remember. And that's, that is that connection. You, you could, I, mean, I could go to a casting agency and find 10 people to like, you know, blurt out marketing lines about things, but find, find the people you can, you live in, you live in the Bay area. I live in the Bay area. We can walk out in the street and throw a rock and hit somebody who knows how to code Python. Uh, <laughs> But do they have that story? Do they have that connection? Do they have that passion? And it's somebody who's doing the interviewing. Uh, they'll look if they're. I mean, if they're good at their job, they'll look for things like that. They're all, they're open to finding those stories because you'll you'll bring that person in and you'll give them an environment and they'll flourish within it because they they're so they want to give that to everybody else. It's huge. It's huge. It's it's less less in tech because I don't feel like tech really connects with people on an emotional <laughs> level, no right. matter what the marketing tells you. Uh, you know, but games are different because games are art, and art is you can only create art with passion. Uh yeah, because I wrote an entire undergraduate paper on how <laughs> games should be on the same level as cinema and literature. And Borderlands 2 was my focus piece. You art, art's supposed to make you feel something, and that's what games do. It was, unfortunately, I have completely lost the document that I was supposed to revise and get published because I was like, I don't, I'm too lazy. I'm not going to do that. And I wish I had it. My advisor doesn't have it. We've completely lost where it was. Maybe Google has it in like the depths of their archive. <laughs> but, um, so I somewhere in a Google wave. <laughs> yeah. So I the caveat of doing this research paper and getting grant money for it was that I had to present at the research symposium. And I've Ooh. I've told this story on stream before, but it's supposed to be this like multi departmental presentation of the the research you've been doing and all of that. And so you know, I think the couple of there's a couple of people before me. There's like maybe fifty odd people in the auditorium. There's a lot of students who are kind of getting ready to like present on their research, and there are a lot of professors who are just silently observing. And so you know, you get like you get architecture, design, you get music theory, you get this, this, and that. And then I get up on the stage and they ask me, "What will you be presenting today?" And I said, "I will be presenting my paper on." video games as a narrative medium so and good. and i swear to god the front row 
all the men, their eyes lit up and they woke up and they're like, yeah. hello, hello. <laughs> and so I spent a good, I don't know, 15 minutes going through my slides talking about how, you know, that new game plus mechanic, it, it shows up in Borderlands 2 as a framing narrative where when you beat the story once and you go back to it, the people talking over the flashback, the, rec the recollection of the events of the game, or was it pre-sequel? It was one of the two. I think it was pre-sequel. I could be misremembering. They talk about how like the characters, the NPCs who are interacting with you as you play through the game a second time, it changes. It completely changes. And you learn more about it. But, you know, all of that narrative is hidden behind the fact that you have to do a new game plus. And who would know to do that? Especially when it was the pre-sequel and people are like, oh, we have Handsome Jack again. Ugh. But it was, you know the start of his downfall you watched him think of himself as a hero and it was literally just you either die a hero or you live long enough to see yourself become the villain right. and so that was the story of the pre-sequel and i wrote about how you yeah, can you said, you said who would even know about a new game plus and every bloodborne player in the world their ears started to burn <laughs> <laughs> but um anyways so they, 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 what was the word? I, I lost it already. <sighs> Let me breathe and slow down. I talked about how the New Game Plus mechanic, it can only exist in video games because they're not necessarily linear, they're interactive. You don't get that with cinema, you don't get that with literature. You can kind of do a choose your own adventure, but it's not the same experience. And I also drew upon um, Uchikoshi's 999 from Zero Escape to explain this phenomenon. Mm -hmm. And I think I even dropped like this whole thing about liminal spaces. I have to go back and like look that up about what that means. Um, talking about how the narrative, yeah, talking about how the narrative is it's locked behind certain flags you have to hit, but because of how it plays out, I don't want to spoil the entire game, because of how it plays out, you realize that the game mechanics, the entire meta of how the story is presented, ties into the story itself. The interactivity becomes part of the storytelling, and yeah. that is oh, what yeah. blew my mind. So, to this day, to this day, 999 is my favorite visual novel. To the point where I put it on my OK Cupid, and this guy messaged me like, "I know 999," and then we dated for four years, and I dumped him. But we dated for four years because he knew 999. But um, yeah. No, but I, I totally agree. Like the new game plus mechanic, and again, it's unique to the video game medium. Right. In no other medium, you get the chance to experience something the first time a second time. <laughs> exactly. And the fact uh, that writers, scenario writers, script play, what, uh, script writers, they can, you know, add that. more to reward the players who do go through the lore, who do go through the narrative, who do yeah. connect with the fictional characters, who do want to marry Josija's voice. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, think about the narrator from Bastion. <sighs> Oh my god, Logan Cunningham, what a genius. His the, the voice way, work. The way the narrator interacted with the, like, and what other medium does the narrator, I mean, I guess you could do like a fourth wall breaking cinema aspect of this, but like the narrator having an effect on the, the way you're experiencing the game that's not just, you know, expository. Yeah, yeah. I remember that he would react to all your like your gameplay mechanics. If you did something stupid, he'd like call you out on it. And then, oh my god, Transistor is so good. Transistor is amazing. Oh my god, now I want to sing a song from Transistor, but I'm not gonna embarrass myself like that. I could never do Red justice. <laughs> not when Ash, not when Ash is the one singing Red. <coughs> uh, it's oh. funny you were talking about the the invocation mm -hmm. uh of story and wanting to know more and it, first i don't know why it sparked this question in my head uh probably because i mean we were talking about music and game music yes and there's a good one for the chat too have you ever listened to a game's soundtrack and 
connected with it, but never played the game? Oh, easily. Always. Every single time. I know a lot of games, not because I've played them, but because the OST hit me so hard. You, know, I only know about like Chrono Trigger because of the music, and now you know people I know oh. are playing it, but I'm trying to think of what other games that I'm aware of simply because the OST caught me. Um, what's a good one? It's hard because I've actually played a lot of games. Like, Xenosaga? I've played Xenosaga. Mm -hmm. Have you played Xenosaga? I have not, no. I remember when it came out, but I've not played it. It is. It was too deep for my high school brain. Because it goes into, like, Gnosticism. It yeah, goes and into all... And all yeah, and all that stuff. And I was like, I, I don't know what's going on, but, like, these enemy boys are kind of cute, so I'm going to keep playing. <laughs> well, game, that's an interesting one by Trifecta, because... I think Ori's visuals are so absolutely outstanding. I've never listened to the soundtrack. Oh my god, I gotta give you a story about Ori that reminded me... A story so, about Ori? Yeah, well, kind of, like, tangentially related. So, remember how I mentioned the mini GDC that I went to? And how mm -hmm. I go to UCI? Or, I'm an alma mater of UCI. So, when I went to the boot camp, I met someone who also went to UCI, and she connected me up with her friend from UCI, who was, you know, like, graduated way before me um he worked at blizzard for a long long time and apparently he owed her a favor so that was how we connected and i wasn't gonna skimp on his consultate on his consultation fee i paid the man 250 dollars to talk to me for an hour to tell me what you need for a game studio so he told me you need this kind of engineer this kind of engineer this kind of engineer blah 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 blah, blah. okay and then he, he he also gave me homework i paid this man to give me homework which I never did, and I plan on doing it eventually, but he paid, I paid him to give me homework. Anyways, the reason why I bring up Zelnath, who I did a shout-out for earlier, is because um, I haven't reconnected with him in a long, long time. But Josija was doing that thing about like underrepresented developers, and he mm -hmm. wanted people to submit things to his Google form. Uh, I, I yoinked that from his, his Nightbot commands or whatever thing was posting in his Twitch chat. I posted it to my professional Twitter and I started doing hashtags and then I tagged Zelnath in it. And I was like, hey, could you check this out? And he's like, I'm not underrepresented, but thanks for thinking of me. I was like, you know I don't mean you. You know I don't mean you. And he's like, yeah, of course, I'll send it out to some people. And after he said he would send it out to some people, I was like, hey, I talked to all of Joe's mods or like three of them on his team. I was like, I, I signal boosted the thing that Joe wanted, and they all were like, oh, he has to put a pause on those. Uh oh, oh, uh oh, uh oh. And I was like, oh, oh, all right, he doesn't have time for those. That's okay, that's okay. And then after they told me that he needed to pause those, Selenath comes back to me and says, I have sent this to 600 developers. <laughs> and so now I am wondering who is going to be the one to check Google for Joe, if not Joe mm -hmm. himself. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I did that on accident. <laughs> but then I found out later on that like Joe's okay with it. He's like, yeah, you know, submissions kind of like stop trickling in, so it's okay. <laughs> but yes, if you, if anybody in chat knows of you know, uh, black, indigenous, people of color, developers, disabled developers, queer developers, LGBTQ, uh, there is a link. I can post it later. I don't know, in the Discord or something. I don't know how we're going to do this. I don't know how we're going to organize this, but we'll figure it out. We'll figure it out. This became my hour to speak. It is now your turn, Kyle. <laughs> I, need, I need some soundtrack recommendations from you, Chad. Soundtrack recommendations. I mean, what's on my brain lately is like near Automata. But... Ooh, I've been meaning to listen to that. And I have not. <gasps> you haven't listened to that? Have you haven't I love listened everything to about that game, although I've never played it. Hang on, I need to give you my favorite track. Persona Five. Yeah, I hear a lot of things that Persona Five is good, but that's because wait, was really did Shoji Maguro is Maguro Sensei still doing the music for Persona Five? Because they had to change the vocalist who's been with them for like ages. So that is my favorite song from Automata. There's like different versions of it. I think this one has no vocals. This is one of the instrumental versions. Oh, it's so good. Oh, yeah, I was watching a playthrough and I'm like, I need, I may need to pick up this soundtrack because whatever's going on in the background here is really awesome. It is fantastic. Um, since Trifecta wants me to plug Persona, 
Um, let me think. Do you want something with vocals? Do you want something upbeat? Do you want battle music? What are you looking for? Okay. Anything at all. Anything what, at all. What, pick a track that you think, if you were, <laughs> if you were standing on a show floor, uh, and said you've got to listen. You've got to listen to this music. Persona 5 is the most amazing game you've ever played. And somebody walked up and said, play me one track that's going to get me into this game. Okay. The thing is, if I were to put music for Persona, I wouldn't go with Persona 5. I would go with Persona 3. Oh. I got to I got to give everybody mass that. destruction. <laughs> I got to give everybody mass destruction. It's the battle music. I love good battle music. Please listen to Persona 3's battle music. Ooh, baby. Mm. I know another good one. I know another good track. Hang on, hang on. This is not, um... This is not Persona, but... This is... I gotta do justice to the fans of this one, because the Persona 5 fans have been slamming on this game because Neo was announced. Hang on, let me grab one. <coughs> So apparently, yo Trifecta, did you know that Lotus Juice streams sometimes? He's on Twitch. I don't know if he's coming back to Twitch, but he was on Twitch for like two seconds. Okay, so you're asking for video game music. I I I love Persona Five. I love Persona Five. I also know that the Persona Five fans are nuts, and they went into the like announcement for the sequel to The World Ends With You. I was like, why is this oh, game ripping yeah, off of Persona that. 5? Please listen to the OST of The World Ends With You. Mm -hmm. God, and this song is not. so good. We listened to that because we were at Harmonics <laughs> at the time and we listened to that and we're like, hey, can we put any of this music in Rock Band? Please. Please that, put that, The World Ends With You in Rock it's Band. It's those questions that's, that, that's why Still Alive from Portal is in Rock Band officially because oh we started God. thinking there's there's all this music that's so good how do we put this in rock band Kyle was one of them Kyle got Kyle's one of us he tried to get portal in rock band and did it <laughs> We've got Kyle watching out for us um what else let me think of the more obscure titles I can think of <laughs> This is not obscure by any means but well maybe it's like obscure now is this the version I'm... Yeah, this is the port. This is actually the remake. So it might be the, like the very super edgelord one, which is what I love because it goes so hard. This is from... I have a, I have a 10 hour video game music playlist and I'm always looking for new things nice. to add to it. Please listen to Tales of Destiny's theme song for Leon Magnus. He is my favorite character in right. the Tales series. Leon is so popular in Japan that they had to remove him from the character polls because he would win every uh -huh. single one, no matter what came out. No matter yeah, what you came can tell out. from his character design that he is that person. He is that person. He is the, <laughs> the most popular in Tales. He is. Yes. <clears throat> oh my god. I, I haven't played a Tales game in a... I, I couldn't get into Cesteria, I couldn't get into Berseria, I'm hoping Arise is going to be good, but I miss Vesperia. I got the port on Switch. I love Vesperia so much, I bought someone a copy of Tales of Vesperia, full price. And then they, they like, blocked me. But it's okay, because as long as they play that game, I don't give a shit that they're no longer my friend. Please Blue play Reflection. Vesperia. Blue Reflection sounds like a two mix album. The game itself is pretty decent, but the OST is without a doubt my absolute favorite. Well. Trifecta, post a link from Blue Reflection while I dig up one that I know is really good, which not many people have played because, again, it was like a uh, visual novel for the DS or something like that. I don't remember which one's like the one. Oh, where is it? You guys are going to hear music as I like. Pl we're going to get DMCA striked. <laughs> What's your favorite track from Dead Cells since you were playing it earlier? I don't have a favorite track from Dead Cells because I can never hear the music because Shep is in my ear blasting me. Oh my god. <laughs> what a, that soundtrack is incredible. <laughs> okay, so this is Hotel Dusk. I think it's by Sync. I think they might no longer exist. Hotel Dusk was amazing because it was like, whew. All right, I'm going to grab that link trifecta. I'm going to listen to that after the stream. 
uh, complete global. I don't know. Oh, pause, 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 pause. Okay, I'll listen to that later. Um, what else has a uh, soundtrack that just goes, ha, I know, I know. We, pfft, dude, this game is so big in Japan that it has an orchestral album release. And if any of you have not played this visual novel, I will come for you. Please, I need everybody to just click that latest link in the chat. Tell me, everybody who is an Ace Attorney fan, raise your hand in the chats! <laughs> Where are my people? <laughs> oh, Ace Attorney. You, you know about Ace Attorney, don't you? Of course I do. Who doesn't know about Ace Attorney? I mean, everybody who plays <laughs> Ultimate versus Marvel Capcom 3 knows that <laughs> Phoenix Wright is in That's that game. That's right, and they then... put Phoenix in that game. <laughs> I keep forgetting that Phoenix Wright is actually in a fighting game. And so now I have to ask the entire chat. I have to ask everybody. Joker from Persona 5 versus Phoenix Wright from Ace Attorney. Who would win? It's funny because Joker is a high school student and Phoenix is like a 24-year-old lawyer man. Who would win? Phoenix has the power of objection. so He has the power of yelling, but Joker has the power of being on probation. So you're right, Joker would lose. Because the man's a lawyer. He's like, you're violating your probation. Don't fight, don't don't mess with me. I mean, yeah, but he's kind of, I think, complete incompetent at the same time. <laughs> no, 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 no. Phoenix's greatest skill is that he can bluff. Maya? Is that Maya from Killer Instinct 2? Or I think Maya? Trifecta's talking about Maya Faye from Ace Attorney. I think our brains are still on Ace Attorney here. <laughs> I like to imagine that it's Maya from Killer Instinct in Phoenix Wright, Ace Attorney. Oh, it's 1 p.m. Would you like to take an intermission so we can both eat? Uh, I Well, I have some appointments. Okay, you have appointments. I, don't, I can't keep you on any longer. I, we were just going to go as long as we could. <laughs> So, but I mean, this has been super fun. It's been fantastic. Uh, yeah, I look, I look forward to. Yeah, you know, by all means, you know, stay in touch, reach out. Like, I'm still trying to set up tabletop simulator with you and Darren. What is that? Just like tabletop style games? Are we gonna play Yahtzee? We could play Yahtzee while social distancing. So Tabletop Simulator is just 3D models of all the board games. You can download them, buy them, get custom oh. mods. I mean, he told me he was playing D&D &D using Tabletop Simulator. Nice. So that's why I asked. Maybe that's why no one responded, because you don't know what Tabletop Simulator is. Now that you know, would you like yeah, to I play... I can guess based on the name. But right, I but like how it works. I mean, I, mean, I don't know. In, in this day and age of blank simulator games it literally could be walking around a furniture store and looking at tabletops somebody would make that somebody, somebody would make that i hope and somebody, somebody like makes that as a meme and like <laughs> references this we started a meme maybe um but yes how much time do you have left uh how much time do you need i am not going to impose upon your schedule this is i am not going to do that to you <laughs> i mean i should i should about around 115 i should probably uh, start working towards other stuff. Okay, how's about this? Chat, for the next 10 minutes, you can ask as many questions as you can get through, and we'll probably only be able to take one, but we can write them all down and then ask yeah, Kyle later. Some questions. I need to use the restroom, so chat, go wild. You have my permission. What? Moderators, please keep an eye on things. Working in games, running a podcast, being an old nerd on the internet. <laughs> song recommendations while everybody who ever loved mass effect go find the track armageddon n7 by jimmy hinson aka big giant circles that track is incredible the album is called max effect it's a lot of outtakes that weren't used in mass effect <clears throat> throw that in the chat He's got two, Max Effect and Legacy.
Yeah, that Armageddon N7 is a reimagining of the Mass Effect theme, and it is so unbelievably good. Uh, <laughs> he did the music for uh, Threes, if you're familiar with that. <clears throat> Uh, and his album, the album that's on that link for Big Giant Circles um, Bandcamp, the Glory Days album is incredible. And the song, The Glory Days, from that album, the self-titled, is the song is um, amazing. It will drag out memories from you <laughs> for games that is like nostalgia turned into a song. I love that Try is like the only one in the chat who has the nerve to ask you anything. <laughs> or is still awake. Or is still awake. I mean, it's 1 p.m. It's, 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 it is siesta hour. <clears throat> Since we are at the tail end of the stream, I do have to do a word from our sponsors. No, I'm not sponsored. However, I might get fired if I don't do this again. Um, please check out my, my boss, maybe? perhaps? Or else I'm going to get fired? Uh, please? Alright. So he is a Lucario main. He plays Smash. He's doing like a Final Fantasy X challenge run. He's going to do a Final Fantasy X2 challenge run. Help him out or I'm going to get fired. <laughs> I don't want to be fired. Um, sorry, were you answering a question from Trifecta? No. Oh, oh 11 I, out of 10 question mark? Technically, that's a question, I suppose. <laughs> um, okay, then I have a question for you. Can yeah. we at all possibly make a uh, tabletop work? Would you be interested? Yeah, absolutely. Sure. Would you want to do it on stream or off stream? That is the biggest question. Totally whatever works for you. You're... you're Hey, we, 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 got, we gotta get the okay first. from Darren Corb first. Oh, and I, I I promised Exo that if I could score tabletop simulator hours with you and Darren Corb, that he would get the fourth spot. Ooh. So he's gonna play with us then. Um, I probably should text Darren after this. Parcheesi. Ooh, you wanna play Parcheesi? Why don't we play Sorry? Because then we can yell at each other and like destroy our friendship. Yeah, but does it, Sorry has the bubble in the middle that you whack that makes the dice pop. I don't feel like there's an accurate representation of that yet virtually. I mean, they probably have like the dome, and then you click on it, and then it just, like shakes up the dice. It wouldn't be the yeah. same. It However, the clicking sound, that iconic clicking sound. We we could just play Yahtzee since it might. I, I need to brush up on my Yahtzee skills. Yeah, but then Yahtzee from no punctuation is going to DMCA us. Would he? Would he really? He'd be better or not. The kind of person who would do it as a joke. <laughs> oh my god, that would be hilarious. Because then I could say, yo, no, there's no such thing as bad publicity. Thank you for the DMCA strike, Yahtzee. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> nah, but have you all looked at my panels? My, like, about section? Please look at the about section. Look at my goals. Please look at my goals. Um, I'll, I... Off the top of my head, uh, be acknowledged by Robbie Damon. Be acknowledged by Sander Mobis. Um, become Twitter mutuals with Darren Corp. You followed me back before he did. I'm not going to force him to follow me back, but I'm just saying, Kyle, Kyle's nice. <laughs> Darren is also nice, but Darren's very busy and does not need to see how cursed my timeline is. Get invited to Guest Grumps. That's a lofty goal. I want to be on Guest Grumps so bad. Yo, when I heard that they got what Finn Wolf. Play? What I want to play with the Game Grumps? Yeah. Now that I know that the Game Grumps are doing a playthrough of Danganronpa and they are doing a visual novel of that prestige, if you will, yo, we're going to play Zero Escape. Oh, there you go. I would be like, hey, Game Grumps, Aaron, Danny, be my friend. Let's play Zero Escape so that we can joke about how tragic this is. The game does it itself. I will I will say this one. It's not a spoiler if you don't know the context of it. Santa from Zero Escape makes a joke about an incinerator. Now everybody who knows Zero Escape is gonna be like, no 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 no. Everybody else is like, oh, an incinerator joke? Like yeah, like at 106 degrees, you toast. But anyways, I'm gonna let you go early. I want to let you go early. 
Well, I mean, your your crew <laughs> seems like the kind of folks who would have already seen this, but I'm going to stick it in your chat. Sure. Obviously, which is the music <laughs> video for Starlight Brigade, since you mentioned Dan Abadan. Oh my god, I love Dan Abadan. He's so cool. He is so cool. Do you know him personally? I don't. We. It's interesting. I actually spoke with some of their folks a while back when they were because they need a <laughs> tour manager because they do those live shows <clears throat> so does, i tossed my hat in the ring there but obviously like, covid shut all that stuff down so. does that mean you could maybe sort of put me in touch with the game grumps because i was thinking about dream daddy i know that's i know that's vernon not necessarily aaron and danny but they were like you know it's under their name <laughs> I can make no promises, but I respect your hustle. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like, I made it as a joke. I joked to all of my really cool, like, my streamer homies that I would take them all to the moon. I mean, it's kind of happening now, though! <laughs> you heard about the Dogecoin thing, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, we're, we're going to the moon! I don't know what's happening with crypto. I don't know much about crypto. I kind of understand the concept of blockchain because I have to work with it. But at the same time, why is it so big? Do you know? Oh, I do. I know an awful lot about blockchain. So maybe on the next episode of whatever we've decided to call this show, we'll oh, talk about yes. crypto and the blockchain. <laughs> we'll talk about crypto and the blockchain as Darren <laughs> like, flexes upon us playing Yahtzee. That's the name of our band, by the way, Crypto and the Blockchain. Okay. Okay, that sounds good. Or a radio show? That would be a good name. Like two radio DJs from like the early 90s, Crypto and the Blockchain. <laughs> crypto and the Blockchain. Somebody is going to go make a website and steal our brand, I'm telling you. I've done that to so many people already. So that so that they would hire you? So that they would buy no. it from you? Uh, not so they would, <laughs> just because it seems like a good idea. And I always have like hover.com ready to go with any possible domain name, so. This I, is... buy, I buy them up left and right. How do you afford... I mean, is it like a one-time fee to buy a domain? Because I know hosting is like, like subscription. Like, no, no, it's just 10 bucks for a year and you own the URL. But then doesn't that mean you have to like pay out hundreds a year? No, I'm not hosting anything. I just own the URL. Wait, but then you, you buy it one-time fee? No, every year it renews. So that's what I'm saying, that like every year, if you have like a bajillion of these URLs, wouldn't that cost hundreds? Uh, yeah, but it's spread out over the course of the year here and there. And, oh, you know, I see. So it's no, not all at once. <laughs> after a year or two, then you just I let get it, it. I get it. I understand. Thank you, Trifecta, for looking out for me. I know the burnout is super real. I, I am pacing myself, believe it or not. <laughs> here, I'm going to throw, I'll throw one more okay. in your chat. Like, this is a good example. I bought this because I thought it was really funny. The hero of time is Link. Oh, that's hilarious. Oh my god. Oh my god, that's so funny. That's hilarious. Somebody get this man an award. Put him on a stage. Let's do some stand up. Yo, yo, so what if I we. Own ton, yeah, I own tons of weird <laughs> domains all over the internet just because I think the names are funny or. Uh, oh, there's only a few times I bought one because I thought that some. Because somebody. I recognized an idea. And for me, and when when the time I grew up in, you know, with the sort of like the dot com mm -hmm. boom and stuff, for me, even the hint of an idea, just go by the URL because if it blows up, you want to have that. If it doesn't, you let it go and only cost you ten bucks. I get it. I get you. It is time for you to go, Kyle. It is time for me to go. Thank you so much for coming absolute on. Absolute pleasure. It's been great. All right, take care. All right, thank you so much. Uh, and. I will I follow guess. up with you Hopefully, about tabletop. Yeah. I'll, I'll talk to you soon. Bye. And thanks to your chat. Thank thanks you, chat. Everyone. Thank you, everyone, for coming. <laughs> We're going to raid someone. Who should we raid? Does anybody have suggestions of who you want to raid so that I don't mess this up? Uh, let's see. Oh, there are people who I follow who are online. Let's see. Apex Legends. Oh, someone's doing Octopath Traveler. Shall we do Octopath Traveler? I personally could not get through Octopath Traveler, but would you all like to surprise someone who has one viewer right now playing Octopath Traveler? <coughs> and then I will I will p 
post the, the raid chant in the thingy, I guess. I, I await chat's demands. My throat hurts a lot. I don't think I'm gonna talk for a while. <coughs> let's go? Okay, let's do it. That is, that is, that is, that is gonna be the raid thingy thing that we do. I don't, you can use my emo, but it's Joker. I don't have a Dimitri one yet. We'll figure it out. All right, I hope everyone has that ready. <sighs> Whoa, I'm gonna, I'm scared. Okay. Okay, here we go. Ooh, I'm nervous. <laughs> I always mess this up. Are you all ready? I hope you're all ready. Let's do it. <laughs> 